let's start the session now. Uh, hello guys, good morning and welcome you all in this DP on this session. Myself, Archie Deesan, I'm your host for this session. Guys, if you have any questions and queries, please put question on chat box. We will be there to help you out. Okay, so let's move in ahead and talking about our event sponsor that is Synergetics. So Synergetics is an India one of kind co-porting learning solution company. Now you will get a question like who we are and what we're doing. So answering your question. We boost our offering and also give comprehensive advisory service to client who wish to modernize their framework. We educate, advise, implement, and manage. Then the synergetic solution offering that is a persona-based onboarding solution, onboarding add-on solution, certification solution, certification add-on solution, reskilling solution, emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre-sales training solution. Practice playbook solution and architecting solution. Then what does Microsoft certification does? It will give you complete learning experience. You will get trained, build confidence to appear for the exam and get certified. Uh, this is skilling journey. Here you can advance yourself. First you have to complete fundamental certification. Then you can go with the advanced role based certification and expert level certification. In fundamental certification, we have AZ900, AI900, DP900, PL900, and SC900. In associate level certification, we have many types of certification. Here you can see on my screen. In expert level certification, we have AZ305, SC100, PL600, and AZ400. Guys, also we have special certification that is AZ120, AZ140, AZ220. If you want any certification, you can connect with us. certification offering so certification will help to increase your visibility expand your knowledge and skills we do provide certification add-on onboarding add-on like short duration modules and more then moving ahead and today training is organized and handled by the atc community so our atc community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technology and various emerging technology under atc community we have emerging technology community for all then Azure Tech Community for Punekas, Emerging Technology Community for Suratkas, Azure Tech Community for Nakukas. Guys, you just have to install the Meetup app and you can follow our communities there. Then you have to follow Code of Conduct, which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note that participants are not allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. We will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. Uh, today's speaker for this training is Mr. Smith Shah. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently works for Synergetics as a training consultant. Agenda for this webinar, you will get to know more about the topic and benefit of it. In today's session, we are providing you DP100 Learning Achievement Badge. You just have to follow the step and you will get the activated badge. Make sure guys you don't forget to subscribe on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube for upcoming events update. Thank you. Now I would like to hand over this mic. Our speaker, he will continue ahead. Thank you, Archie, to set the context for this session. So guys, good morning to each and every one of you. My name is Smith Shah and I will be your mentor for today's session. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer and I've been in the data science field since the past seven years, wherein I've delivered trainings for multiple international as well as domestic clients, including Walmart, LTI Mindtree, Capgemini, and many, many more. Apart from that, I'm also a Azure certified data engineer, a Azure certified data scientist, as well as a Azure certified AI engineer. So that was just a brief introduction about me. Now let's start our webinar. So guys, today's webinar is on DP100. 
DP100 is all about how you can implement machine learning on the Azure platform. Okay. So it's all about how you can implement machine learning on the Azure platform. So in order to implement machine learning on the Azure platform, Azure offers us three different ways. What are those three ways? Let's talk about it. So the first way is called automated ML. Here what happens is here you just mention the type of model that you want to create and just by a single click of the button, the model will be created for you by Azure. Okay, so you don't have to worry about any technicalities that will go behind the scenes. All you have to mention is the type of model you want to create and Azure will create that type of model for you. Okay, so that is automated ML. Okay, wherein the entire ML pipeline will be implemented by Azure itself, will be implemented automatically by Azure. Okay, so that is automated ML. That's the first approach that Azure provides us in order to implement machine learning. The second approach that Azure provides us is called designer ML. So here what happens is you will have pre-written blocks of code okay and what you have to do is you're in the second approach you have to select which block of code should be executed at which step in the first approach which was automated ml there you didn't have to worry about anything okay you don't have to worry about coding at all in fact you just mentioned the type of the model that you want to create and Azure created that type of model for you, right? Just by a single click of the button. It was that easy. Whereas in the second approach, you will be given pre-written blocks of code. Okay, so pre-written blocks of code will be given to you. It's just that you have to select. It's just that you have to select which block of code to execute at which step. Okay, you have to select which block of code should be executed at which step. Okay, so that is the second approach, right? The third approach is called the notebook approach. Okay, here what happens is, here you have to write the complete code. Okay, you have to write the complete machine learning code. Okay, so just to recap, so guys, we are gathered over here to talk about a course called DP100. DP100 is all about how you can implement machine learning on the Azure platform. In order to implement machine learning on the Azure platform, Azure provides us three different approaches. First approach is called automated ML. In the first approach, you just mentioned the type of model that you want to create to Azure and Azure will automatically create that model for you. You don't have to worry about any technicalities that will happen behind the scenes. You just mention the type of model you want to create and just by a single click of the button, Azure will automatically create that type of model for you. So that is what happens in the first approach. The second approach is called designer. Here you have pre-written blocks of code available to you and you have to select which block of code should be executed and which step. The third approach is called notebook approach. Here you have to write the complete machine learning code. Yeah. Fine. So in each of the approaches, diff, um, you have different level of controls. Uh, in the first approach, which is automated ML, you just mentioned the ML type, the uh, machine learning type, the machine learning model type that you want to build, and Azure will create it for you. Right. Um, Behind the scenes, what will happen? You have no control. Okay, so you have no control over what will happen behind the scenes. In designer ML, okay, in designer ML, uh, you have moderate control, whereas in notebook approach, you have full control. Okay, fine. So over here, I've just given you a brief that DP100 course is all about implementing machine learning on Azure platform. And in order to implement machine learning on Azure, 
Azure provides these three approaches. Now let's go ahead and let's start with basics of machine learning. Probably some of you guys would not know the basics of machine learning. So let's cover that. Also in your DP100 examination, questions will be asked related to basics of machine learning as well. All right. So let me explain to you the basics of machine learning. So the first question in your mind would be, what is machine learning? You would have probably heard of it. But what is it? What is machine learning? So guys, machine learning is nothing but a set of tools that is used for two purposes. First purpose is to get inferences from data. And second purpose is to get predictions from data. By inference, I mean getting insights from data. By inference, I mean getting insights from data. Okay. Um, so for example, let's say I have data of a very popular retail store called DMART. Looking at that data, I'm coming to know that more people are coming in DMART on Sunday as compared to Wednesday. So what I will tell my manager, I will tell my manager that, okay, manager, make sure that on uh, Sunday, all of our employees are prepared in a better way to handle that large influx of customers, right? So I'm getting that insight. So that was a small example of insight. Okay, like this, you can get different, different insights from your data. So machine learning is, you, is just a set of tools that is used for two purposes. First purpose is to get inferences from data. In other words, to get insights from data. Second purpose is to get predictions from data. By prediction, I mean trying to know something about the future. Okay, trying to know what will happen in the future. So let's say based on how it has rained in the year uh, 2023, I want to predict how it will rain in the year 2024. That's an example of prediction. Okay, fine. So if anybody asks you what is machine learning, you will say machine learning is a set of tools that is used for two purposes. First purpose is to get inferences from data. Second purpose is to get predictions from data. Now you might ask me that, okay, Smith, how do we do that? How do we get inferences and predictions from data? So guys, we do that by using something called a machine learning model. Now, this is a very fancy term used in the market nowadays, right? Machine learning model. But what does it mean? So let's look at the definition of a machine learning model. The definition might look complex at first, but don't worry. I will try to simplify it for you. So let's look, let's look at the definition of a machine learning model. So guys, a machine learning model is nothing but a statistical representation of a real world process. What do I mean by this? Let's try to understand. Okay. So in order to help you understand, I will take an example. So in that example, let's say I have surveyed some of the houses in my locality. So I have information about the area of the house in square feet. And I also have information about the price of that house. Okay. So let's say the first house that I surveyed had an area of 100 square feet and the price of the house was 1 crore. The second house that I surveyed had an area of 200 square feet and the price of the house was 2 crore. Similarly, the third house that I surveyed had an area of 300 square feet and the price of the house was 3 crore. Now I have a question to each and every one of you. Let's suppose I have information about a fourth house. That area, the area of that fourth house is 350 square feet. But I don't know the price of that house. So I want you guys to help me predict the price of this fourth house. So guys, according to you, what do you guys predict? What could be the price of this fourth house over here? Pavan Kumar has given an answer. Pavan Kumar mentions 3.5 crore, right? Even Hitakshi says the same, 3.5 crore. So over here, you have given me a prediction of 3.5 crore. Now, in order to arrive at this prediction, let me ask this question to Akhilesh. So Akhilesh, in order to arrive at this prediction, you gave a correct prediction, buddy. But in order to arrive at this prediction, did you use some mathematics in your head? Yes or no? Correct? You did use some mathematics. Can I say that? Yes, right. So all of you who have given answers over here, all of you who have given your predictions in the chat, you have given correct prediction. 
and in order to arrive at that prediction you did use some mathematics in your head that's exactly what a machine learning model also does a machine learning model also tries to use mathematics or tries to use statistics to simulate what would happen in the real world okay so just like you guys try to use statistics you guys tries to use mathematics to simulate what would happen in the real world similarly a machine learning model also would do the same fine all right so up till now we have covered two things the first thing that we saw was what is machine learning we said that machine learning is nothing but a set of tools used for two purposes first is to get inferences from data second is to get predictions from data how do we do that how do we get inferences and predictions from data we do that by using something called a machine learning model what is a machine learning model it's a statistical representation of a real world process in simple terms what is a machine learning model in simple terms we are just trying to simulate a real world process by using some statistics or by using some mathematics okay fine so let's move forward over here now let's uh, learn about important notes that you need to remember before creating a machine learning model first important note is that for creating a machine learning model you need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns okay that is note number 1 so in order to create a machine learning model you will need data and that data will need to have some rows and some columns you might ask me that smith i have uh, heard that we can also create a machine learning model on image data now image data by default is not in form of rows and columns i agree in that scenario you will have to convert that image data into rows and columns okay how to do that that's a separate topic but whatever data you have it needs to be converted into rows and columns okay so that is note number 1 that in order to create a machine learning model you need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns now second important note to remember is that the columns in the data will be of one of the two types either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column feature columns are those columns that help me to predict whereas target column is that column that i want to predict let's understand the difference between a feature column and a target column with the help of a example so suppose i have information about some of the houses in my locality and here is their data now my first question to each and every one of you is my first question is on this data can i create a machine learning model yes or no i repeat my question on this data can i create a machine learning model yes or no i see answers from shiv and pavan kumar in the chat they have mentioned that absolutely yes we can create a machine learning model and these guys are absolutely right as per note number 1 in order to create a machine learning model i need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns and here on your screen we do have some data having some rows and some columns so on this data definitely i can create a machine learning model whether it turns out to become a good machine learning model or a bad machine learning model that's a different topic but i can definitely create a machine learning model okay so note number 1 has been understood by all of you guys let's understand note number 2 which says that columns in the data will be of one of the two types either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column feature columns are those columns that help me to predict target column is that column that i want to predict so if i want to predict on price then price will be which type of column can any of you answer that i repeat my statement guys as per note number 2 there are two type of useful columns in your data first type of useful column is called your feature column second type of useful column is your target column what is the difference between the two feature columns are those columns that help you to predict target column is that column that you want to predict So if I want to predict price, then price will be which type of column? I can see answers from Shiv, Hitakshi, Akhilesh, and Karthik in the chat. As you have rightly mentioned, if I want to predict on price, then price will be my target column, right? And since square feet and city help me to predict price, they will be called my feature columns. Okay. 
So I hope these two notes are clear to everyone. Note number one mentions that for creating a machine learning model, you need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns. Second note mentions that there are two types of useful columns in, their, in your data. First type of useful column is called your feature column. Second type of useful column is your target column. What is the difference between the two? Feature columns are those columns that help you to predict. Target column is that column that I want to predict. If there are any other columns apart from feature or target, then those are useless columns for us and we need to remove them. Okay, fine. All right, so let's go ahead. Now let's learn about the different types of machine learning models. So guys, remember there are many, many types of machine learning models. On your screen, I have only shown you two types, but remember there are other types also. In fact, after every eight to 10 months, a new type of machine learning model is launched into the market. But 95% of the work done in the machine learning industry is done on these two types only. That's why for now we'll focus on these two types. Okay. But remember there are other types of machine learning models as well. Okay, fine. So as we know, there are two types of machine, uh, as we know, there are many, many types of machine learning models, but out of those many, many types, we'll only focus on two types for today. First type is called supervised learning model. Second type is called unsupervised learning model. What is the difference between the two? In case of a supervised learning model, your data uh, has feature columns and target columns both. Whereas in case of a unsupervised model, your data only has feature column, but it does not have target column. I repeat, what is the difference between a supervised learning model and a unsupervised learning model? In case of a supervised learning model, your data has feature and target columns both. In case of a unsupervised learning model, your data only has feature columns, but it does not have target column. Now, supervised learning models are further divided into two types. First is classification model. Second is regression model. What is the difference between the two? Well, in case of a classification model, your target column has finite set of possibilities. Whereas in case of a regression model, your target column has infinite set of possibilities. Let's understand the difference between a classification model and a regression model with the help of an example. So suppose I have a target column with me called dice roll. So let's say I'm playing a game of dice with my friends and whatever value I get after rolling the dice, that value I'm storing it in this column. So let's say when I first roll the dice, I get the value four. Then second time when I roll the dice, I get the value six. Third time when I roll the dice, I get the value one. Fourth time when I roll the dice, I get the value six again, let's say, and so on. So let us assume that this column is your target column. Now this column is dice roll column, right? So in dice roll column, do I have finite set of possibilities or do I have infinite set of possibilities? Let me ask the question in a different way. So when I roll a dice, how many possible values can we get? Can anyone answer that? When I roll a dice, how many possible values can I get? So Karthik and Ankit have mentioned in the chat that when we roll a dice, we can get six values. Either we can get the value one or two or three or four or five or six. So we have six possible values to get, right? So in dice roll column, I have finite set of possibilities, right? That means limited set of possibilities. Okay, so dice roll column has finite set of possibilities. If dice roll column is your target column, that means your target column has finite set of possibilities. And if your target column has finite set of possibilities, then your model will be called a classification model. Let's take one more example. Suppose I have a column with me called gender. Wherein what I'm doing is I'm storing the gender of every employee in my office. So let's say the first employee in my office had a gender of male. The second employee in my office had a gender of female. Third employee in my office had a gender of female and so on. So let us assume that this column called gender is your target column. 
So guys, if gender is your target column, now let me ask you guys a question. In this target column, we have finite set of possibilities or infinite set of possibilities. What do we have? Finite set of possibilities or infinite? So Karthik, Shiv, Akhilesh, Hitakshi, all of you have mentioned that we have finite set of possibilities in gender, right? There are two possibilities we can say. Either the gender will be male or female. Okay, so in other words, you are saying that, okay, in gender column, you have finite set of possibilities. So if gender column was your target column, and if in your target column, you have finite set of possibilities, then your model will be called a classification model. Okay, let me take one more example. Suppose I have a column with me called stock price. And what I'm doing is I'm storing the price of the stock that I bought after every day. So let's say on the first day, the price of the stock was 100.97 rupees. After that, on the next day, it was 99.2 rupees. On the third day, it was 99.738 rupees and so on. Now, I have a question for each and every one of you. If stock price column was my target column, then in this target column, do I have finite set of possibilities or do I have infinite set of possibilities? So Karthik says that I have infinite set of possibilities. Perfect. So if stock price column was my target column, and if in my target column I have infinite set of possibilities, then my model will be called a regression model. So guys, with this, we have completed basics of machine learning. So is basics of machine learning clear to each and every one of you? Made sense? Just want confirmation from your side. Uh, yes. Okay. I can see confirmation in the chat. All right. If you have any doubts, you can ask that doubt to me in the chat. Okay. Fine. So we have understood basics of machine learning. Now let's move forward. So what we'll do is we'll try to create a machine learning model. Okay. But what is the machine learning model? We know a machine learning model is nothing but a statistical representation of a real world process. That means in order to create a machine learning model, I will need to use some statistics or I will need to use some mathematics, right? So you can create your own mathematical algorithm. Algorithm is nothing but a series of steps. So you can create your own mathematical algorithm or you can create your own statistical algorithm to create your model. Or else you can use some ready-made mathematical algorithm available in the market. I repeat, we know in order to create a machine learning model, mathematics will be used. Statistics will be used. That means mathematics will be used. Now you can create your own mathematical algorithm. That's also fine. However, let's say you don't want to create your own mathematical algorithm then you can use some of the ready-made mathematical algorithms available in the market. Okay, so let's learn about some of the ready-made mathematical algorithms available in the market because in your DP100 examination, questions could be asked based on them. Okay, so let's talk about some of the ready-made mathematical algorithms available in the market. The first mathematical algorithm that we'll talk about is called multinomial naive bias. The first mathematical algorithm that we'll talk about is called multinomial naive bias. Okay, the full name is multinomial naive bias. I should mention that full name in the heading. It's called multinomial naive bias. Okay, so let's see how it works. So guys, you would have a doubt that this algorithm is used to create which type of model? Supervised learning model or unsupervised learning model? So guys, this algorithm is used to create a supervised learning model. Then you would have a doubt that within supervised, we have two types, classification and regression. So for which type is this algorithm used for? Is it used for classification or is it used for regression? So guys, this algorithm is only used for classification purposes. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's see how this algorithm works. Now. Using this algorithm, we'll be creating a machine learning model, right? So in order to create a machine learning model, we will need some data. So let's have an overview of the data that I'll be using in my slides. Okay, I will give you an overview of data over here. Let me mention that overview in a separate whiteboard. I repeat myself again. 
we are going to use this algorithm called multinomial naive bias to create a machine learning model. But we know to create a machine learning model, I will need some data. So I'm just introducing that data to you. So what is the data that I'm going to work with in my slides, in my PPT? Okay, let's see that. So guys, I have data of different emails. What do I have? Let's suppose I have data of different emails. Okay. And my task is to predict whether an email is a normal email, whether an email is normal email, or spam email, okay, whether an email is normal or spam. If you guys are aware, in your email engines, whether it's a email engine like Outlook or whether it's an email engine like Gmail, in each of those email engines, what happens is it automatically detects, it automatically tries to detect whether the mail that you are receiving is a normal mail or a spam mail. If the email engine feels that the email that you are receiving is a spam email, then it puts that email in a separate spam folder, right? If you have observed. So internally, what it is doing, it is trying to implement some machine learning model. Okay. So let's say if we wanted to create such a machine learning model, how would we do it? So let me introduce the data that we'll be using to create that machine learning model. So let's suppose, guys, you have one feature column in your data and one target column. Now, in your feature column, you have text of different emails. So in the first row, you have text of email one. And correspondingly in the target, you have information about that email, whether that email belongs to normal category or spam category. Let's say the first email belongs to normal category. Then in the second row, you have text of second email. And correspondingly, you have information about whether that email belongs to normal category or spam category. So let's say the second email also belongs to normal category. Then in the third row, you have text for third email. And correspondingly, in the target column, you have information about whether that email belongs to normal category or spam category. So let's assume the third email belongs to spam category. Okay. So like this, let's suppose we have information about different emails. Okay. In total, guys, I have information about 12 emails. Out of which 8 are normal and four are spam, okay? Out of the 12 emails, eight are normal and four are spam. All right, so this is the data that I will be using in my PPT. All right, so guys, we are going to go ahead and create a model using this algorithm called multinomial name bias. As I've explained to you, this algorithm is only used to create uh, which type of machine learning model? It used to create a supervised learning model. Not unsupervised, it is used to create a supervised uh, learning model. Then within supervised, it is uh, used to create which type of model classification or regression. So this algorithm is used for classification purposes. Okay, so let's see how it works. So first what I will do is I will focus on normal emails and based on count of words in normal emails, we have created this histogram. What we have done based on count of unique words in normal, normal emails, we have created a histogram. So the diagram that you see on your screen is called a histogram. Okay, fine. Now in 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 real world scenario, guys, a normal e I mean uh, my normal emails would have thousands of unique words. However, over here, just to keep the example simple, I have assumed that let's suppose we have only four unique words in my normal emails. Although in reality, in real world, you would have probably thousands of unique words. 
Okay, but just to keep the example simple, I'm assuming that let's suppose in your norm, normal emails, there were only four unique words. First unique word is called dear. Second unique word is called friend. Third unique word is called lunch. Fourth unique word is called money. So as per the histogram that you see, in your normal emails, the word dear is occurring how many times? You can count it over here. It is occurring a total of eight times. Then in your normal emails, the word friend is occurring how many times? You can count over here. And you can see in your normal emails, the word friend is occurring five times. Then in your normal emails, the word lunch is occurring how many times? It is occurring three times. In your normal email, the word money is occurring how many times? One time only. Okay. So what I have done based on count of words in normal emails, I have created a histogram. Now I have a task for you. The task is to calculate probability of obtaining the word dear in a normal email. Can anyone give me that probability? What is probability of obtaining the word dear in a normal email? If you are not able to figure out, not a worry. Um, let me give you a hint. Okay. So Karthik, I will need your help, buddy. So Karthik, in my normal emails, the word dear is occurring how many times? Eight, right? As Akhilesh has mentioned in the chat, that in my normal emails, the word dear is occurring eight times. Okay. So 8 divided by what? 8 divided by total number of words in normal emails. So guys, in your normal emails, what is the sum of all the words? The word dear is occurring 8 times. The word friend is occurring 5 times. The word lunch is occurring 3 times. The word money is occurring 1 time. So if you sum this, what is the sum? Sum is equal to 17, right? As Kanish. Kanishk and Rachna have mentioned in the chat, it will be 70. Okay. So when I ask you the probability of obtaining the word dear in a normal email, it is nothing but 8 by 70. Okay. Because the word dear has occurred 8 times in normal emails and total number of words in non normal emails is 17. So probability of obtaining the word dear in a normal email will be 8 by 70. Similarly, guys, what will be the probability of obtaining the word friend in a normal email? What will be the probability of obtaining the word friend in a normal email? Karthik has mentioned it correctly. Even Shiv, Ramu, Kanish, Akhilesh have mentioned it correctly. That probability of obtaining the word friend in a normal email will be 5 by 17. Similarly, probability of obtaining the word lunch in a normal email will be 3 by 17. And probability of obtaining the word money in a normal email will be 1 by 70. Okay. Now that I have dealt with normal emails, let me go ahead and let me deal with spam emails. So here what I have done, based on count of the words in spam emails, I have created a histogram. Okay. Based on count of the words in spam emails, we have created a histogram. I'll mention it over here. I'll just mention that based on count of unique words in spam emails, we have created a histogram. Okay. So in spam emails, the word dear is occurring two times. In spam email, the word friend is occurring one time. In spam email, the word lunch is occurring zero times. In spam email, the word money is occurring four times. So now I have a question to, um, to ask you. The question is, what is the probability of obtaining the word dear in a spam email? What will be the probability? So Akhilesh has mentioned the correct answer. Akhilesh says that, that in spam emails, the word dear has occurred two times. So two divided by total number of words in spam emails. In spam emails, total number of words will be equal to 2 plus 1 plus 0 plus 4, which is equal to 7. So total number of words is 7. 
So probability of obtaining the word dear in a spam email will be two by seven as Akilesh, Ramu, Umesh, Karthik, and everybody has mentioned. Okay, probability of obtaining the word dear in a spam email will be two by seven. Similarly, probability of obtaining the word friend in a spam email will be one by seven. Similarly, probability of obtaining the word lunch in a spam email will be zero by seven and so on. Okay, like this, I'll keep on calculating probabilities. Okay, so let's say I've done that. Now I have a question to each and every one of you. So I was working on my email data. In that data, if you remember, I had mentioned that we are dealing with 12 emails in total. Out of those 12 emails, eight belong to normal category and the remaining four belong to spam category. So if I ask you, what is the probability of obtaining normal emails in my data set, then what will be that probability? What is the probability of obtaining a normal email in my data set? Probability of obtaining a normal email. So there are eight normal emails total, right? Out of how many emails? Total number of emails are 12. So probability of obtaining normal emails in my data set will be eight by 12 as Karthik, Rashna, Rishi, Umesh, Kanish, and Akhilesh have mentioned in the chat that probability of obtaining normal email over here will be eight by 12. Similarly, what will be probability of obtaining a spam email in my data set? Spam email has occurred four times out of how many emails? 12 emails. So probability of obtaining a spam email will be four by 12. Okay, so just like you guys have mentioned in the chat, Probability of obtaining a normal email will be 8 by 12 and probability of obtaining a spam email will be 4 by 12. Okay, now let's go ahead and let's see um, what will happen ahead. Now, let me ask a general question to you. It's not related to AI, just a general question. In fact, let me ask it to one student. Let me ask it to Rishi. So Rishi, let's suppose I'm going to bet on a cricket match. Let's say there is a cricket match going on between India and Australia. And I want to bet on a team. So can I say, Rishi, what I will do is in my mind, I will calculate the probability of India winning versus I will calculate the probability of Australia winning. And whichever team has the highest probability of winning, I will, I will bet on that team. Is that the strategy that I will apply? Yes or no, Rishi? Yes, right. That's the strategy. So what, what was the strategy that, okay, let's say if I want to bet on a cricket match, if the, if a cricket match is going on between India and Australia, which team would I bet on internally in my mind? What I will do is I'll calculate probability of India winning versus I'll calculate probability of Australia winning and whichever team has highest probability of winning, I will bet on that team. The same approach is followed by this algorithm as well. This algorithm called multinomial knife base follows the same approach. So let's say an email was received by us. The email had only two words in it, dear friend. Although in reality, an email could have lots of words. But just to keep the example simple, let's assume that you received an email wherein you had only two words mentioned in it, dear space friend. Okay, so dear and friend, these are the only two words. So now you want to calculate whether this email belongs to normal category or whether this email belongs to spam category. So what you will do? First, you will calculate probability of that email belonging to normal category. Then second, you will calculate probability of that email belonging to spam category. Whichever probability is higher, you will say that this email belongs to that particular category. Okay, fine. So let's see. So guys, uh, let's suppose I have received this email having only two words, dear friend. So I want to know that this email belongs to which category. As I mentioned, first I will calculate probability of this email belonging to normal category. Then I will calculate probability of this email belonging to spam category. Whichever probability is higher, I will say that this email belongs to that particular category. Okay. So first let's calculate the probability of this email belonging to normal category. So I will have probability of obtaining a normal email into probability of obtaining the word dear in a normal email into probability of obtaining the word friend in a normal email. 
I already know all these probability values. I will just substitute them in my equation. And what do I get at the end? That probability of obtaining a normal email is 0 0.09. If I want to calculate probability in terms of percentage, just multiply this probability by 100. So we can say that there is 9% chance of this email belonging to normal category. Okay, 9% chance. Okay. Similarly, let me calculate probability of this email belonging to spam category. Now, just the announcement over here to make that currently uh, this algorithm called multinomial naive base is based on naive based formula. Naive based formula was a probability formula that was developed in around 1970s. And an announcement related to that is that through this formula called naive base, it's not necessary that always the probability values will sum up to one. Okay, otherwise normally what happens is, let's say there is a match going on between India and Australia. We want to calculate probability of India winning and calculate probability of Australia winning. Okay, so we'll say that, okay, probability of India winning is, let's say 0 0.7. That means 70 percentage. Probability of Australia winning is, let's say 0 0.3. That means 30 percent. So normally what happens is when you sum pr the probability values, they sum up to one, right? That's what happens in normal probability based formulas. Whereas in knife based formula, that doesn't happen. It's not necessary that always the probability values will sum up to one. Okay. Anyways, moving forward. So guys, I wanted to decide whether this email belonged to normal category or spam category. So first I'm calculating probability of this email belonging to normal category. Then I will calculate probability of this email belonging to spam category. Whichever probability is higher, I will say that this email belongs to that particular category. So let's see how to do it. So here, guys, I've calculated probability of this email belonging to normal category. Here the probability came out to be 0 0.09. At percentage terms, we can say 9%. So there is 9% chance that this email belongs to normal category. Okay. Similarly, let me calculate probability of this email belonging to spam category. So I will have probability of obtaining spam emails into probability of obtaining the word dear in a spam email into probability of obtaining the word friend in a spam email. I'll just substitute the probability values. And when, when I do that, I get a value at the end saying that probability of obtaining probability of this email belonging to spam category is 0 0.01. In percentage terms, we can say 1%. Okay, because in order to convert probability to percentage, you need to multiply by 100. So we can say there is 1% there is chance of this email belonging to spam category and 9% chance of this email belonging to normal category. So guys, which probability is higher? 0 0.09 is higher or 0 0.01? Which probability is higher? Probability of this email belonging to normal category or probability of this email belonging to spam category. Uh, uh, Achilles says that probability of this email belonging to normal category is higher. Right? That's how I will declare. That's how I'll make my prediction that, okay, I will predict that this email belongs to normal category. Okay. So I've shown you the theory of this algorithm called multinomial naive base. Is the theory clear to each and every one of you? If the theory is clear, I will move on to the implementation part. I hope the theory is clear. Okay, I can see a confirmation from Akhilesh. So Akhilesh has mentioned that yes, theory of multinomial naive base algorithm is clear. Okay, I hope to other students also it's clear. I can see other confirmations as well in the chat. Okay, perfect. So now that you have seen the theory of multinomial naive base, let see its implementation okay implementation so i will show you how to implement uh, then with azure also i will show you but first let me implement without azure so i will just open a coding tool in my local laptop this coding tool is not related to azure installed in my local laptop and i'm opening that coding tool and through that code i will implement this algorithm the one that we saw so we saw the theory of a algorithm called multinomial naive base. Now it's time to show you the implementation as well. 
So let me do that. For that, I will create a coding file in my coding tool. So let me create a new coding file. OK, this is where I will write my code. So guys, in order to implement a supervised learning model, supervised learning model means a model wherein you have feature column and target column both. So in order to implement a supervised learning model, we have to follow some steps. First step is to make sure that data should be clean. That means there should be no spelling mistakes. OK, apart from that, there shouldn't be any missing values. OK, and so on. OK, so you have to ensure that data should be clean to use. All right, the second point to, uh, for implementation is to extract the features and target columns separately. So you have to extract the feature column separately and you have to, have to extract the target column separately. The third important step for implementation is to make sure that features are on the. I mean, the features are of numeric nature. OK, that means all the feature columns should have numeric values. If they do not, let's say if a particular feature column is not of numeric nature, then you will convert it to numeric nature. OK, then fourth step is to ensure that features should have some rows and some columns. Features should have some rows and some columns. Now this might look like a very basic step, but it's very, very important. All of these steps that I'm mentioning are important. Don't neglect anything. In fact, today I will show you uh, because uh, many a times people feel that this fourth step is very basic. It's fine even if we don't satisfy it. Well, you are wrong. This is a very important step and you have to make sure that as for step number four, it has asked you to make sure that features should have some rows and columns. So you have to take that into consideration. Okay, you have to make sure that your features do have some rows and some columns. If they do not, what is the going down the line? I'll show that as well. Don't worry, I'll show that today. Okay, the fifth step is to split the data into two parts, training and testing. So what is the idea behind doing this? Let me explain that to you. OK, so let's suppose I have some columns with me. Square feet and price. Let's suppose square feet column is my feature column. And price column is my target column. OK, and I'm going to have some values over here. Let's say the first flat had a square feet of 100 square feet and the price of that flat or the price of the house was 1 crore. The second house had an area of 200 square feet and the price of that was 2 crore. The third house had an area of 300 square feet and the price of the house was 3 crore. OK, similarly, I will mention other values as well. OK, so now let's talk about step number five. So what is the idea? So the idea is you will divide certain rows into training and testing. So let's say what I'm doing is 60% of the rows I'm putting it in training. The remaining 40% I'll put it in testing. Let's suppose. OK, so currently I have five rows in my data. 60% of five is three. So that means three rows will go into training and the remaining two rows will go into testing. Okay. So let's suppose the first three rows went into training. OK, but remember, it's not always that your first three rows will go to training or your last three rows will go into training. No, the selection of rows in, of training and testing is random. But let's suppose even in that random selection, what happened is the first three rows went into training and the last two rows went into testing. OK, so what you do is you only train the model on the training data set. So while training the model, the model is only exposed to the training data set. The testing data set is hidden to the model. So once the training is done, OK, then you try to see how is the model performing. So you try to test the model. 
so there the idea is that for feature values of the testing data set let us predict target column value so let's suppose it predicts over here something like um 3 crore for the next feature value it predicts a target of 5 crore okay so there were two rows in the testing data set out of which for how many rows was correct prediction made only for one row correct prediction was made. Okay, so the accuracy will be total number of correct predictions, which is one divided by total number of predictions. In my testing data set, I did total two predictions. So my accuracy will be 0 0.5. In percentage terms, we can say that it is 50% accurate. Okay, fine. So this is the idea behind training and testing. Okay, we'll split the data into two parts, training and testing. Now, the sixth step is to make sure that features are on the same scale. By same scale, I mean same range of values. So for example, if we have two columns, let's say one column is called score, another column is called rating. So we know score values could be between one to 100, whereas rating values will be between one to five. Okay, so here the two columns are not on the are not having the same range. They are not having the same scale. Because of this, there could be issues going down the line. What could happen is uh, a feature column that has higher range could be gaining more. Um, you know, in could be having more involvement in prediction as compared to a feature column that has lesser uh, lesser range. Okay, so if you don't care of uh, you, if you don't take care of this range issue or this scale issue, then what will happen? A uh, feature column having a um, higher range will contribute more to prediction as compared to a feature column that has lower range. Okay, fine. So let's move forward over here. But, so you need to make sure that if at all feature columns are not on the same range or the same scale, you convert them to the same scale. But remember, this should only be done on algorithms which involve which involve calculation of distance distances between the row values. Okay, so this should only be done on algorithms which involve calculation on dist of distances between the row values. All right, let's move on to step number seven. And by the way, guys, our algorithm that we were working on currently, the one for which I give you the theory explanation, it was called multinomial naive base, right? This algorithm, multinomial naive base, does it involve calculation of distances between row values? No, it doesn't involve. In these steps, I didn't see anywhere where it was calculating distances between row values. That's why for our current algorithm, step six will not be performed. I will show you some algorithms going forward, which in which do involve calculation of distances between row values. So what to do in that scenario, I will show you that. Okay, but for our current algorithm, step six will not be implemented, it will be ignored. Moving on to step number seven, which is to train the model on the training data set. Then step number eight and the last step, which is to test the model on the testing data set. So guys, these are the eight steps that you need to implement before, uh, for making a supervised learning model. Okay, so for making a model, we know we need some data, right? So let's go ahead and let's get that data. So let's suppose I have data of some of the tweets, okay? So let's suppose I have data of some of the tweets. So I have recorded tweets of two people, Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau. What I have done, I have recorded tweets of two people, Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau. So I want to make a machine learning model that predicts whether a tweet has been written by Donald Trump or whether a tweet has been written by Justin Trudeau. Okay. 
So I want a model that if at all uh, anybody shows that model a tweet, that model should be able to tell me whether, whether that tweet has been written by Donald Trump or whether that tweet has been written by Justin Trudeau. Okay, so let me show you that data set. So here guys, in the last column, we have information about different tweets. And in the second last column, we have information about the author of those tweets. The other columns are useless for us. Okay, there is no need at all. Out of the two useful columns, which is the last column and the second last column. Okay, what will be a feature column? What will be a target column? So my task was to create a machine learning model that can easily predict the author of the tweet just by looking at the tweet itself. So I want to predict author of the tweet. So this author column will be my target column. And the column that will help me to predict author will be my feature column. Okay. So the last column is your feature column. The second last column is your target column. All right, fine. So uh, let's go ahead and first let's implement these steps. First step over here is to make sure that data should be clean. There should be no missing values, no spelling mistakes and so on. Here I have already checked for spelling mistakes in my data, but let me check for missing values. Currently, you can see in the first column, we have zero missing values. In second column, we have zero missing values. In third column, we have zero missing values. In fourth column, also we have zero missing values. So none of the columns have any missing values. That's a good thing. What about spelling mistakes? You can cross check that for the entire data, but I've already done it. There are no spelling mistakes in my data. Okay. So that's good. Now let's proceed ahead. Let's move on to the second step. We know as per the second step, we have to extract the feature column separately and target column separately. Now, the last column is my feature column, right? And the second last column is my target column. Okay, so let me extract those separately. So the last column is my feature column. And the second last column is my target column. Second last column is called author. So that column will be my target column. Okay, so step number two has been done. Moving on to step number three, which is to ensure that features are of numeric nature. So you need to check if the feature column has numeric values or not. On checking, we observe that there is one feature column only and that to non-numeric. So if you want to convert a non-numeric feature column to a numeric feature column, what would you do? Let me go ahead and let me explain that over here. How would you convert a non-numeric feature column to a numeric feature column? Okay, so let me open the whiteboard for the same and I, and I will explain to you how to convert a non-numeric feature column to a numeric feature column. So first you need to check guys whether that non-numeric feature column is continuous in nature or it is discrete in nature. Okay. So whether that non-numeric feature column is discrete or continuous. What is the meaning of discrete and what is the meaning of continuous? So discrete means a column having finite set of possibilities. Whereas continuous means a column having infinite set of possibilities. Now, if your non-numeric feature column is a discrete column, then how to convert that discrete non-numeric feature column to a numeric feature column? Well, you have two options. Either you can use a popular tool called one a popular uh, technique called one out encoding or you can use this technique called dummy encoding both the approaches will work depending on the scenario you need to choose the appropriate appro approach out there so in which scenario which approach to use i will explain that to you today don't worry so if your non numeric target column uh, sorry not your target column if your non-numeric feature column is discrete in nature, 
you have two options to choose from. One is either one not encoding, second is dummy encoding. On the other hand, if your non-numeric feature column is continuous in nature, then you have two options. One is TF IDF vectorizer. And second one is cloud vectorizer. Sorry, not uh, my mistake. Uh, count. Okay, I should use the word count. Not cloud. My mistake. I misspelled it. Count vectorizing. Okay. So let's learn about this technique first, count vectorizer. Let's see how it works. And by the way, guys, uh, you tell me, by the way, currently I have one feature column with me. This is your one feature column. And you can see that it is non-numeric. So I want to convert it to numeric. I want to convert it to numeric. In order to do that, first we need to decide whether this non-numeric feature column is continuous in nature or discrete in nature. So you tell me, guys, is this discrete in nature or continuous in nature? Discrete or continuous. So she was trying to say continuous, right? That's what you are trying to say, say over here, Shiva, I guess. Continuous, right? So if your non-numeric feature column is continuous in nature, then you have two possibilities to choose from. Either you can choose TFIDF vectorizer or you can choose count vectorizer. So that's what we'll be doing. We'll be choosing either TFIDF vectorizer or count vectorizer. Now, before going ahead, I can see a doubt from Pawan Kumar. Pawan Kumar says that I have a question. Let's say two data set with a lot of columns are there. And in that, there are two columns that are similar, but the column names are different. How do we remove the duplicated column? So first, Pawan, always what happens is if, uh, you try to analyze your data. Okay. So as a data scientist, you would have, um, I mean, this entire course, DP100, uh, you can see the title of it. It says, I mean, it talks about being a data scientist. Okay. So as a data scientist, you need to do two things. Analysis, you need to know. Second thing that you need to know is modeling, how to create models. So to answer your question, first, you need to analyze your data. So that analysis part you have to do. Then on analyzing the data, either through graphs or through manual analysis, whatever type of analysis you do, you have to analyze your data and then you will come to know that, okay, uh, whether my data is clean to use or not clean. If it's not clean, then you will make it clean. Okay, so that uh, the solution for your query is analysis. Okay, that analysis, uh, we are not going to cover in this session. Okay, but solution to your query, Pavan Kumar, is analysis. So every time online, if ever you, you see any blog or any model that is implemented, first thing what they will do is always they will do analysis. They will try to draw some graphs over the data if you have observed. Okay, if you have not observed, don't worry. Maybe going down the line, you will observe it. Okay, any blog you see online, any tutorial you see online, first they will always try to analyze the data. Okay, fine. Uh, so through analysis, you can get to know more about data, then you can see whether if it is clean to use or not clean. Okay, so solution to your query is analysis. Analysis we are not covering in our today's webinar, but fine. So to answer your query, you have to do first analysis. And then based on the analysis, you have to take the appropriate action. Okay, since analysis is not part of our today's webinar, I will not talk about it going forward. Okay. Coming back to our main query. So guys, currently we were dealing with one feature column. I have only one feature column in my data. That to non-numeric. So I want to convert it to numeric. So first I wanted to check whether this non-numeric feature column is discrete or continuous. We know it's continuous. So I have two options to choose from. Either TFIDF vectorizer or count vectorizer. Okay. So let me show you how count vectorizer works. Let me go ahead and let me show to you how count vectorizer works. I'll just give a heading over here. Count vectorizer. Now let's suppose guys, I have information about some tweets. Okay, there's a tweet column. 
and I have information about some tweets over here. So let's suppose in the first tweet I have mentioned that cricket is a good sport. In the second tweet, someone has mentioned that sport of cricket is a exciting sport. Okay. So you can see this tweet column over here is a continuous column. It's non-numeric definitely, but it's a continuous non-numeric column. How to convert this to a numeric column? Let's see. So in count vectorizer, first what we do is we count what are the, I mean, first we uh, find out what are the unique words in my non-numeric continuous feature column. So in my non-numeric continuous feature column, what are the unique words? So your cricket is a unique word. Is would be a unique word. A would be a unique word. Good would be a unique word. Sport would be a unique word. Then this word is not unique. It has already occurred previously. This word off is also, yeah, it's a unique word. This word cricket is not unique. It has already occurred previously. This word called is is not unique. It's already occurred previously. The word called a is not unique. It has already occurred previously. The word exciting is unique. The word sport is again not unique. It has already occurred previously. So if I count over here, guys, I can see that I have a total of seven unique words, right? Seven unique words. So for each of those seven unique words, a separate column will be made by count vectorizer. For each of those seven unique words, a separate column will be made by count vectorizer. First unique word is cricket. So a column for cricket will be made. Second unique word is called is. So a column for is will be made. Third unique word is called A, so a column for A will be made. Fourth unique word is called good, so a column called good will be made. Fifth unique word is called sport, so a column called sport will be made. Then sixth unique word is called uh, off, so a column of off will be made. Second, uh, the seventh and last unique word is called exciting, so a column for exciting will be made. So there were total seven unique words in my non-numeric continuous feature column. Since there were seven unique words, I have created seven columns over here. Now, let us go ahead and let us count how many times these unique words are occurring in my non-numeric continuous feature column. So in the first row of your non-numeric continuous feature column, the word cricket is occurring how many times? One time. In the first row, the word is, is occurring how many times? One time. In the first row, the word A is occurring how many times? One time. In the first row, the word good is occurring how many times? One time. In the first row, the word sport is occurring how many times? One time. Okay, now a question. Let me ask that question to each and every one of you. In the first row, the word off is occurring how many times? In the first row of my non-numeric continuous feature column, the word off is occurring how many times? As Akhilesh, Umesh, Hitakshi, Rachna, and everybody has mentioned in the uh, first row of my non-numeric continuous feature column, the word off is occurring zero times. So I've mentioned zero. Similarly, in the first row of my continuous non-numeric feature column, the word exciting is occurring zero times. So I'll mention zero. Okay. Let's move on to the second row. In the second row, the word cricket is occurring how many times? One time. In the second row, the word is is occurring how many times? One time. In second row, the word A is occurring how many times? One time. In second row, the word good is occurring how many times? Zero times. In second row, the word sport is occurring how many times? I can see two times. Okay. In the second row, the word off is occurring how many times? One time. In second row, the word exciting is occurring how many times? One time. Okay. And now have a look, guys. Have I converted my non numeric values? into numeric values now. So from non-numeric, have I converted into numeric? Have I done that? Have the non-numeric values been converted to numeric values? Yes, right? In the process, I ended up with more columns than what I had before, but that's fine. My, at least my non-numeric values have been converted to numeric values. This process that you just saw right now, of converting non-numeric values to numeric values is called count vectorizer. 
this technique that you just saw over here is called the count vectorizer technique. Okay, so enough for the theory of count vectorizer. Let's do a quick implementation. So uh, for that, I will need help of a class which I will import from a library. So from a scale on folder, there is a subfolder called feature extraction. From that subfolder, uh, there is a file called text. And from that file, I will import this class called count vectorizer. Okay, currently I have an error. Okay, let me write the import statement properly. And let's see if it works. If it doesn't work, we'll try to see. I'll try to solve the issue. Currently, the code is being executed over here. I can see it from this star tick mark. It has not fully executed yet. So let us wait for it to fully get executed. After that, I'll show you what to do. It is still executing. Okay, it has executed now. Okay, that star mark has gone. Okay, so the code has executed. Okay, it got executed successfully. So my class has been imported successfully. Now let me call the class. So this is like waking up the technique. Okay, I will ask the technique to wake up because I'm going to implement you. Okay, so I'll ask the technique that please technique wake up. So here by calling the class, I'm waking up the technique. Okay, in simple words, you can think of it like that. Now, what I will do is, I want to implement this technique. So I'll use this method called fit underscore transform. Here the word fit basically means scanning. Guys in machine learning, um, another word for scanning is fitting. Okay. So uh, if you remember for count vectorizer, we had to first scan how many unique words were there. So we realized that, okay, there were seven unique words. So we should create seven columns, right? So we had to scan our non-numeric continuous feature column. So for scanning, here I will use this method called fit. Okay. Then after scanning, fine, you will realize the total number of unique words. You will create that many columns. Now in each column, you will mention the count of those unique words. And like that, you will convert or you will transform your non-numeric values to numeric values. Okay, so that for that, I'm using transform method. So your fit underscore transform will do two things. First, it will scan the non-numeric continuous feature column. And after scanning, it will transform the non-numeric values to numeric values. Okay, fine. So let me apply this on my feature column over here. So guys, depending on the number of unique words, that many new columns will be created. Okay. Uh, also remember that your each, uh, I mean, count vectorizer is case sensitive. So it would treat a word like apple differently. So let's say we have two words, apple. One starts from with capital A, another starts with small case A. Both of the words will be treated as different words by count vectorizer because of this case difference. So, so to avoid it in your data cleaning, what you should have done is, in your step number one, what you should have done is you should have made sure that uh, if at all I have some words that have uh, uppercase, all of those are converted to lowercase or you could do it the other way around also that all words of lowercase are converted to uppercase like that. Okay, you want to make sure that case is same for every word so that if at all a word, let's say we have two words, apple, one starts with small a, another starts with capital A. Or let's say, one is something like this. Okay, both of these words will be treated differently. Okay, so to not that let that happen, you need to make sure that uh, there is no difference in case of in terms of case. Okay, uh, so you need to convert each character in your data of the same case, whether convert each character to lower case or whether convert each character to upper case. Okay, I've not done that over here, but that's fine but ideally it should be done. Okay, fine. So um, third step done. Now fourth step, which says that features should have some rows and some columns. So let's check whether they do have some rows and some columns. On checking, we observe that my features has 400 rows and 2,528 columns. 
So guys, there were 2,528 unique words that were identified in count vectorizer. That's why count vectorizer created 2,528 new columns. Okay, fine. So fourth step done. I do have some rows and some columns. That's good. Fifth step is to split the data into training and testing. So let's do that. So in order to do it, I'll need help of a function which I will import. So from a scale on folder, I have a file called model selection. From that file, I will import this function called train test split. Okay. Now, before I go ahead and implement it, explaining this concept will take uh, around uh, 20, 15 to 20 minutes. So till then, uh, let's take a short uh, tea slash coffee break. Okay, because it's been one and a half hours since I'm training and you guys might need to refresh yourselves. Okay, uh, so we will continue our implementation journey ahead. Till then, let me take a short tea slash coffee break. But up till now, guys, is the implementation making sense? Yes, sir, Ron, and I will explain that other vectorizer technique to you. Okay, at that time, it will make more sense. I have not explained that yet. Currently, I've only explained one technique to you. We'll see it going forward. Okay, fine. So I can see confirmation in the chat that up till now it's being understood by you guys, whatever I'm uh, teaching you. All right, fine. So let's take a short tea slash coffee break. We'll come back and then continue our implementation journey. So I'll take a break of around 15 minutes and then we'll be back. Till then, I'll just be on mute, guys, and I will come back after the tea break.
Welcome back to the session, everyone. Hope all of you are back after the break. Now let's resume. So guys, before the break, I had explained the theory of an algorithm called multinomial naive bias, and then it was time to implement that algorithm. There are a total of eight steps to implement it. Out of the eight steps, we have already covered the first four steps. Now it's time to cover the remaining four. Okay. So let's start with this step. Step number five, I mean, wherein we are going to split the data into two parts, training and testing. For that, I'm importing a function. After importing it, let me use that function. The first thing that I will do is I'll pass my features inside of this function. Then I'll pass my target, right? So I'll pass my feature and target. These two things I'll pass. Okay. And then I will mention the ratio in which I want the division of data to happen. So I know that I want to divide my data into two parts, training and testing. So how many percentage of the rows will go into training? How many percentage of the rows will go into testing? I need to specify that. So let me mention my test size of 0 0.2. This means that 20% of the data okay, will go into testing. Test size equal to 0 0.2 means 20% of the data will go into testing and the remaining 80% will go into training. Okay, fine. So now that I've mentioned the ratio in which I want that division to happen, let's learn more about train test split. So we know that, okay, some of the rows will be um, selected as rows of training data set. Some of these rows will be selected as rows of testing data set. Now I have a question to each and every one of you. The selection of rows into training and testing, is it done randomly or not? What do you feel? So for example, let's say out of five rows, I want three rows in training. So is it like always the first three rows will go into training or the last three rows will go into training? So is the selection happening in order or is it done randomly? So Hitakshi, Akhilesh, Karthik, Rachna, Akshit, all of you have mentioned in the chat and you have correctly mentioned in the chat that selection of rows into training and testing is random. Okay. Because of that random selection, there could be some problems. Let's try to understand that problem. Okay. So let me ask it to Saravanan. So Saravanan, uh, let me ask a general question to you, not related to A, just the general question. So Saravanan, um, so first, uh, let's say if I'm training you, then does the number of examples matter? For example, let's say you're going to appear for a test tomorrow. So the number of examples that I give, does it matter? Like, is it that the more ex examples I give, the more better you will be? Yes, right? Same applies to the model also. So guys, with respect to the model, each row in the training data set is treated as an example. The more rows you have in the training data set, the better it is for the model. Okay. So each row in the training data set is treated as an example for the model. The more rows in the training data set you have, the better it will be for the model. Okay. So Saravanan has agreed on one thing that, okay, number of examples matters. Saravanan, apart from number of examples, does the quality of examples also matters? Does the quality also matters? Yes, right. Quality also matters. So just like it matters to you, Saravanan, it matters to the model also. Okay. So to the model, two things matters. First is number of examples that you are passing for training. Second is quality of examples that you are passing for training. Here by examples, I mean rows. Okay. So the number of rows in the training data set matters. The quality of rows in the training data set matters. Okay. So. Um, let's suppose I have a data set with me. Okay, let's suppose I have a data set with me. In that later data set, let us assume that I have um, three good rows. Okay, row number one is a good row. Row number two is a good row. Row number three is also a good row. Whereas row number five, sorry, row number four and five are bad rows. 
Okay, row number four and five are bad rows. Now, what do I mean by good rows and bad rows? Okay, let's try to understand that. So sometimes the values in those rows might be a little confusing to the model. What do I mean by that? Let me uh, explain that to you with help of an analogy over here. So what do I mean by good rows? What do I mean by bad rows? In order to understand it, let's take help of an analogy. So suppose in that analogy, let's say Saravanan, you are the principal of a school. Okay, so let's say Saravanan is the principal of a school. And Saravanan as a principal, let's suppose you are responsible for creating benches for your students. So let's say we have a first standard students with us. And your job is to create benches for them. Okay, so what you are thinking is um, before giving the order to the carpenter that create a bench of this height, create a bench, a bench of that height and so on. What you are thinking is why don't you survey uh, the first standard students so that you can get an idea of their height and then appropriately you can give that order to the carpenter that okay I want a bench of this height or that height and so on. Okay, so you are trying to survey the first standard students and you are trying to find out their heights. So let's suppose the first that uh, first student had a height of 2.1 feet. Second student had a height of 2.2 feet. Third student had a height of 2.05 feet. Whereas fourth student had a height of 7 feet. Now let me ask this question to everyone. So guys, this student whose height is 7 feet, having a student of 7 feet height in first standard, can I say that this student is an outlier or an odd man out? Can I call him that? A outlier or an odd man out? Yes, right? Okay. Now, does having outlier or odd man out values, does it affect my calculation? Let's see. Okay. So your Saravanan is the principal. What, what has Saravanan thought of? Saravanan has thought of to create benches for first standard students. So he's thinking that why don't I survey the first standard students based on their average height. I will give the appropriate order to the carpenter. So he is now trying to create average height. So he uses a calculator over here. He opens the calculator and he's trying to calculate average height. That okay, first student had a height of 2.1 feet. Second student had a height of 2.2 feet. Third student had a height of 2.05 feet. And fourth student had a height of seven feet. Let me calculate the average height. The average comes out to be 3.337. So I'll call it 3.34. I'll just round it off to 3.34. So the average is 3.34. So now Saravanan as a principal goes to the carpenter and he says to the carpenter that create benches Assuming that average height of student is 3.34. Okay, assuming that average height of student is 3.34 feet. So now, once he gives this, once Saravanan gives this order to the carpenter, can I say, guys, the first three students will suffer because of this order? Because this bench that Saravanan is designing will be too big for the first three students. Can I say that? First three students will suffer. Fine, the last student will be able to work on this bench, but at least the first three students will suffer. So, if I include outlier values in my calculation, it affects uh, my overall calculation, right? It negatively affects. That's the point that I'm trying to make. That if you involve outlier values in your calculation, it negatively affects the calculation. Okay. So uh, let's suppose in some rows, you had those outlier values. So we'll call those rows bad rows. Okay. That let's suppose in some data uh, for some rows, you had certain outlier values. So let's call those rows bad rows. Okay. Because if we involve those outlier values in a calculation, it negatively affects the calculation. And what does the model do behind these scenes? It does some mathematical calculation only. No? So uh, 
when the model will use these row values for doing mathematical calculation, it will negatively affect that mathematical calculation. So I'll call these rows bad rows. So let's suppose out of five rows, top three rows are good, whereas the remaining two rows are bad. Okay. And what we are thinking is let's do train test split and we'll do it in such a way that 60% of the rows, rows, let's suppose, are going to training data set. And 40, the remaining 40% are, let's say, uh, I want I want it to go into testing data set. I have a total of five rows. 60% of five is three. So that means three rows will go into training data set. Two rows will go into testing data set. Okay, fine. As you guys have told me, that selection of rows into training and testing is random. So let's randomly select three rows in training. Now, even in random selection, there is a possibility that first three rows might get selected in training, which is possible. So let's assume that first three rows got selected in training, even in random selection. And the remaining 40% of the rows will be selected in testing. Okay. Now, the rows that were selected in training were good rows. Okay. So let's suppose the model will be trained on good rows. If the model is trained on good rows, that means good examples. See, each row in the training data set is treated as an example for the model. So here my model is being trained on three rows. There are three rows in the training data set. So my model is, between, is being trained on three rows or three examples. Here all these rows or all these examples are good as highlighted by this green color. So if my model trains on good rows, the performance of the model will be good. Okay. So let's say today you created this model and today you train the model on good rows and performance of the model was very good and you got 99% accuracy for the model. Let's suppose, okay, let's suppose you got 99% accuracy. Okay, now you are very happy by looking at this accuracy. So you call your boss at that same moment and you tell your boss in your office that boss, I have created a very good model. The accuracy of that model is 99%. So your boss will also be happy. He will tell you that, okay, come to the office the next day and show me the model in front of me. So you go to the office the next day but next day when you go to the office can i say guys that next day when you go to the office and you try to do train test split again is it possible that next day different rows could be selected in training and testing is it possible or not that next day tomorrow when i do train test split again in front of my boss at that time different rows could be selected in training and testing so let's say now what has happened is these three rows have been selected in training. And the remaining two obviously in testing. Okay, let's suppose the three rows got selected in training. Now with because of this what will happen is now you can see the rows selected in training. Some of those rows are bad rows. Okay, so if the model is being trained on bad rows, I mean as indicated by this red color over here, some of the rows are bad rows. So if the model is trained on bad rows, the performance of the model is bad. Okay, so let's say the model has trained on bad rows and now uh, the model is only, let's say, 40% accurate. So now your boss will be very angry. He will say, are you fooling me or what? Yesterday you told me you are getting 99% accuracy. Now you are showing 40% accuracy. Are you making a fool out of me or what? So you are not making a fool out of your boss. Okay, what was the issue over here? The issue was that Yesterday, we had different rows in training and testing. Today, in front of your boss, you have different rows in training and testing. That is causing the issue. So what we want is, what is the solution? Okay, what is the solution over here? So guys, the solution to avoid this embarrassment, the solution is to have same rows in training and testing again and again. To have same rows in training and testing again and again. Okay, so today also I want same rows in training and testing. Tomorrow also I want same rows in training and testing. One month later also I want same rows in training and testing. How to achieve that? In order to achieve it, we will use a concept in Python called seeding concept. I won't explain that uh, internal working of the concept, but just remember, I will just give you an overview because that concept is quite lengthy. It will take one to two hours just to dive into that concept. 
but let me give you overview of seeding concept okay so let me show you the proof so there is a concept in python called seeding so the idea behind it is uh, that just like if i plant a seed of tomato in my garden always in my garden tomato will only grow right from that same seed of tomato tomato plant will only grow it's not that from a seed of tomato watermelon will suddenly grow out of it no so if you pass same seed every time again the same fruit will go every time okay so here that same concept is being used let's see how to implement that concept let's suppose i'm generating a random number okay so here i'm writing the code to do random number generation you can see every time when i run this code i'm getting different different random numbers generated okay now let me introduce this seeding concept what i will do is i'll pass a seed value over here now remember you can pass any positive value as a seed any positive value you can pass okay let's suppose i'm pass okay now you tell me guys kanish you tell me which seed value to pass any seed value of your choice kanish any seed value give me a positive just remember that seed value has to be positive real number okay seed value has to be a positive real number so kanish give me a seed number of your choice kanish is kanish there okay i guess kanish might not be in front of his laptop so not a issue i will assume a seed value on my own so let me pass a seed value over here of 15 Okay, so I'm passing a seed value over here. Okay, Rachma has given a seed value, forty-two. Fine. So let me pass that seed value. Now you see over here when I pass that seed value, have a look what is happening. With the same seed value, you will get the same random number generated every time. Have a look. I pass the seed value of forty-two over here. Same random number was generated. Below also I pass the seed value of forty-two. Same random number was generated. So guys. Seeding concept is used in Python to have uh, uh, same random value generated every time. Okay, fine. So uh, how it works internally, I won't go into the depth because then our main agenda of the webinar will fall apart. Okay, because this concept of seeding is quite long. So how it works internally, I won't uh, dive into that. Uh, but just remember that seeding concept is used in Python. Uh, to make sure that okay, fine, random number is generated, but if you want same random number generated every time, then you can introduce this seeding concept with different seed. You will get different different random values. Okay, so if I'm if you are passing the same seed every time, then same random value will be generated every time. Same seeding concept I will use over here in train test split. Okay, so I'll pass that seed value to this parameter called random state. So just like we pass the value of forty two over here. I can pass a value of forty-two here. I can pass a seed value of forty-two. Just remember that it should be a real number and it should be positive. Okay, fine. So if I pass a seed value of forty-two right now, then the let's say right now row one, row four, and row five have been selected in training data set. So let's say ten years later also with the same seed value, same rows will be selected in training data set and testing data set. Okay. So with the same seed value, you will get same rows selected in training and testing data set every time. Okay, fine. So if I pass a seed value of forty-two right now, and if I pass a seed value of forty-two ten years later, then today and ten years later, you will get same rows selected in training and testing. All right, fine. You can pass any seed value. Just remember that it should be a positive number and it should be a real number. Okay, it should be positive and a real number. All right, fine. So once a uh, problem had arised, that uh, and that problem was had arised because of different rows selected in training and testing every time. So here we have taken care of that with this seeding concept. Now what will happen is same rows will be selected in training and testing every time. Okay, same rows will be selected in training and testing every time. So I don't want that. uh today i am getting a different accuracy tomorrow i am getting different accuracy no if today i am getting bad accuracy then tomorrow also with the same training and testing data set i should get bad accuracy okay right so i want it to be consistent it should not be that okay tomorrow i get different accuracy today i am getting different accuracy that i don't want to avoid that i wanted to make sure that i get same rows in training and testing selected every time and i did that by using this seeding concept Now there is another problem that might arise in train test split. 
So let me explain that problem to you. What could be that problem? There is another problem, that, guys, that could arrive in train test split. Let me explain that problem to you, and then we'll, we will arrive at the solution. So let's suppose I have a target column with me. And what I'm doing is, let's say I'm, uh, I have a telescope in my house. And through that telescope, I'm trying to find out, uh, I'm trying to look for a Mars planet, okay, through my telescope. So let's say on the first day, I did not find a Mars planet. Okay, I did not find a Mars planet. On the second day, I did not find a Mars planet. On the third day also, I did not find it. On the fourth day, I did not find it. On the fifth day, I was able to see a Mars planet. On the sixth day also, I was able to see a Mars planet. On the seventh day also, I was able to see, and on the eighth day also, I was able to see. Okay, fine. So let's suppose I have a target column like this. And what I want to do is I want to split this data into training and testing. So let's suppose what I'm doing is I'm doing 50% of rows into training and the remaining 50% of rows into testing. Okay, so total I have eight rows in my data. 50% of eight is four. So what will happen is uh, four rows could be selected in training and four rows could be selected in testing. Okay, so let me mention it over here that I have a total of eight rows. A 50% of eight rows I want in training data set, 50% of eight is four. That means four rows will be selected in training data set and remaining four rows will be selected in testing data set. Okay, fine. So let's do that. So four rows in training data set, four rows in testing data set. Now we know selection of rows in training and testing is random. But let's say in random selection, what happened was uh, the first four rows got selected into training. And the remaining four got selected into testing. Okay, now let me ask a question to each and every one of you. Can I say, guys, that we, you and me, I mean, all of us, we only know those things on which we are trained, whether we are trained on it in a school time or in a college time or in real world or internet or in our office or wherever. You and me only know those things on which we are trained, right? Same applies to the model. The model will also know only those things on which it, which it is trained. The model gets trained on the training data set. Here, how many rows I have in my training data set? Four rows. I have four rows in my training data set. That means four examples in my training data set. In any of the example of your training data set, have you even passed one example where the planet is a Mars planet? Have we done that, guys? In the rows of the training data set, is there even one example where the planet is a mass planet? No. So here the model does not even, I mean, here the model trains on the training data set. In the training data set, we have not even passed a single example where the planet is a mass planet. So how will my model know that such a planet called Mars exists? See, if nobody had trained you that this round thing that you see in the night sky is called a moon, you would not know it's a moon. Right? So uh, here, the point that I'm making is just like you only know those things on which you are trained. The model also only knows those things on which it is trained. Here, the model is being trained on four rows or four examples. In the rows or in the examples of the training data set, I'm not even passing a single example where the planet is a mass planet. So because of that, the model will not know that such a planet exists. If it does not even know that such a planet exists, then how will it predict it? It will never ever predict a mass planet, right? It will never ever predict a mass planet because it doesn't know that such a planet exists. So how will it predict it? Okay, fine. So to solve this issue, so currently we have a problem with us. Okay, the problem is that in my training data set, I'm not passing examples of a planet called Mars. Because of this, the model will not know that such a planet exists. Okay, and if it does not even know that such a planet exists, then how will it predict? predict it it will never predict it okay it will never predict uh, it will never do prediction on it okay so to so we have a problem let's see the solution the solution is by using this statistical concept called stratification the idea is that the proportion of values present in original target column should be the same 
as proportion of values present in train and test data set. Okay, or should be similar to proportion of values present in train and test data set. What does it say? What does this technique called stratification say? The proportion of values present in the original target column should be similar to proportion of values present in the target column of train and test data set. Okay, fine. So let's go ahead and um, let's see how to implement this uh, technique of stratification. Okay, so guys, uh, have a look in my original target column. In my original target column, guys, uh, there are two unique values, right? Mars and not Mars. So these unique values are occurring in which proportion? In your original target column, what is the proportion of these values? What is the proportion of these values, guys? Can I say 50-50% as Abhijit, uh, Akshit has mentioned, right? that uh, in my training data set, uh, the value not mass is occurring 50% of, sorry, in my um, original target column, the value not mass is occurring 50% of the times. In uh, the, my original target column, the value mass is occurring 50%. Okay, so stratification says that, okay, if in the original target column, mass and not mass are occurring 50-50%, then in training data set also, it should occur 50-50%. In testing data set also, it should occur 50-50%. Okay, fine. So let's see. Fine. So now apart from maintaining this uh, train test split ratio, I will also maintain this stratification ratio. Let's see. First, like to, let's try to do train test split. I want four rows in training, four rows in testing. Okay. So now what could happen is maybe the model could select these four rows in training. And the remaining rows will be obviously selected in testing. So the remaining rows will be selected in testing. Okay. Fine. So four rows in training, four rows in testing. What are the rows in training? Let me mention that over here. So the rows in my training. Let me mention that with a different color. So these are the rows in training. Let me mention the values that I've selected in my training data set. These are the values. Okay, and what are the values selected in my testing data set? Let me mention that also. So these are the values selected in my testing data set. The remaining values will be selected in your testing data set. Let me mention those values over here. I'll just mention those values. And now have a look guys. Fine, uh, our train test split ratio got satisfied. Let's see whether the stratification ratio got satisfied. Stratification mentioned that if in the original target column, the values not mass and mass are occurring 50-50%, then in training data set also, not mass and mass should occur 50-50%. In testing data set also, not mass and mass should occur 50-50%. Okay, let's see. In training data set, is not mass and mass occurring 50-50%? Yes. In testing data set, is not mass and mass occurring 50-50%? Yes. That means my stratification ratio has also been achieved. And now let's see whether uh, the problem got solved or not. Previously, what was the problem, guys? Previously, the problem was that in my training data set, I was not passing even a single example where the planet was a Mars planet. Because of this, the model did not know that such a planet exists. If it does not know that such a planet exists, how will it do prediction on it? It will never ever do prediction on it. Right? So, now have a look. Now in your training data set, guys, 
you have enough examples of both the type of target values you have enough examples of mars target value you have also enough examples of not mars target value so now your model will be aware about both the type of target values if it's aware about both it will be able to do prediction on both okay it will be able to do prediction on both okay Fine. So we had a problem earlier and we found a solution to that problem uh, by using this technique called stratification. So let's try to implement that technique. So I'll just write it in my code. I want to apply stratification. Where do I want to apply? Remember guys that this problem was related to target column. So stratification needs to be applied on my target column. This problem was related to target column. So stratification needs to be applied on my target column. I'll say, please apply stratification on my target column. Okay, that's it. Now train test function will do the job and it will split your data into training and testing. First, it will split your feature column into training and testing. So I'll get feature train and feature test. Then it will split your target column into training and testing. So you will get target train and target test. Okay, with this fifth step is done. Moving on to step number six which is to ensure that features should be on the same scale. But remember, this should only be done on those algorithms that involve calculation of distances between the row values. Currently, the algorithm that we'll be implementing is called multinomial name bias. It does not involve any calculation of distances whatsoever. That's why for my current algorithms, step number six will be ignored. Step number seven is to train the model on the training data set. Okay, so let's do that. So uh, for making a model, I will have to use some mathematical algorithm, right? Here, the mathematical algorithm that I'm planning to use is called multinomial uh, naive base. Okay, so let me uh, import that algorithm. So I will say from sklearn folder, there is a file called uh, naive base. From that file, import this class called multinomial NB. This is the class that will help me to implement that algorithm of multinomial naive bias. Let me call this class with that. It's like waking up the algorithm that OK algorithm. Now be ready. I'll be using it. So with this, the algorithm will wake up. Now using the algorithm, I want to go ahead and train the model. So guys, for training, what should I do? So let's suppose you are training on a textbook, just like in our school and college time when we used to train on textbook. What what are we essentially doing? We are scanning the content in the textbook, right? When we are saying that, okay, we are training on the textbook, then essentially we are scanning the contents in the textbook. Here in machine learning, what is another word for scan? I had explained that to you before the TV. In machine learning, what is another word for scan? There is a special term that we use. It is called fitting, guys. Fitting. Okay, it's another word for saying scanning. All right, so you want to scan uh, which data set? Training data set. Okay, so out of the four things that you got in train test split, which things belong to training data set? Feature train and target train belong to training data set. So I'll pass these two things over here. Fine, and with this, training will happen. Here, there were very few rows. Uh, in your training data set total in my data set had 400 rows out of which 80 percent was sent into training 80 percent of 400 is 320 so there were 320 rows in training and uh, remaining 20 percent that means the remaining 80 rows were went into, uh, had gone into testing okay so in training there were only 320 rows that's why the training got completed in a few milliseconds depending on upon the number of rows uh, and uh, number of columns in your training data, um, the training time will increase. Okay, fine. Seven step done. Now eight step. Eight step was to test the model on the testing data set. So let's do it. Let's test the model on the testing data set. So I want to calculate the performance score of the model on the testing data set. So out of the four things that I got in train test split, which things belong to my testing data set? Feature test and target test belong to my testing data set. So let me get these two things and let me pass it to my code over here. And now what I'm doing, I'm testing the model on the testing data set. So here, since this is a classification model that you are testing, right? 
classification model means a model wherein my target column has finite set of possibilities. And here in my data, my target column has finite set of possibilities. So it's a classification model. Since it's a classification model, we will use accuracy to judge its performance. What is the formula of accuracy? It is number of correct predictions divided by total number of predictions. Okay, so let's say in the testing data set there were 80 rows, right? So uh, it, will do, it will do prediction on all those 80 rows. Let's say out of those 80 rows, in 72, in 72 rows, uh, correct prediction was made. So the accuracy of the model on the testing data set will be 0 0.9. In percentage terms, I can say that the model is 90% accurate, right? Okay, let's see here uh, what will be the accuracy. Here it says 0 0.925. So in percentage terms, we can say 92.5% accurate. Okay, fine. So we are getting an accuracy over here. Now we can make the model more better. Okay, there are multiple ways. I'll show you one approach over here. Um, now, uh, let me show, show that to you. What should we do to make the accuracy better? So let me ask you a question. Let me ask this question to Akhilesh. Akhilesh, let's suppose if I'm giving some information to you, okay, uh, let's say out of 10 uh, information, let's say 10 points that I give to you, eight points are good, but the remaining two points are confusing. Can I say because of that, because of those confusing points, your overall impression of the uh, training session will go down? Can I say that Akhilesh? Because of the confusing points that I give, your overall impression of the training session that I am delivering will go down, right? Basically, the understanding of the concept will go down. Although the eight uh, points that I mentioned were good, but because of those remaining two points that were confusing, uh, you will have uh, doubts related to that concept. So, what we are thinking is, why to introduce confusion at all? So, if I feel that, okay, the remaining two notes the remaining two points that I'm going to communicate are confusing. It's better to not make those points only. Okay. So only keep important information that could be good for the model. Bad information, just remove it. Okay. Keeping that in mind, currently my model had trained on how many columns? So in my training data set, uh, there were 320 rows and how many columns? 2528 columns. Okay, so out of my overall data set, which had 400 rows and 2,528 columns, out of that, 320 rows went into training and 80 rows went into testing. Okay, fine. So model trained on 320 rows and 2,500 columns. Okay, fine. Uh, now, um, as, especially I want to focus on these columns. So guys, it's very important to understand which column is worthy enough to be a feature column. So you should only keep that as a feature column. If it's not worthy to become a feature column, don't keep it uh, because unnecessarily it will create con con confusion for the model. So if you feel there is a column that is not worthy to become a feature column, don't have it as a feature column, remove it. And now I have a, I have a question to each and every one of you. Do you think these words like is, the, and, do these words help for me to predict if a tweet has been made by Donald Trump or if a tweet has been made by Dustin Trudeau, do these words help me to predict that? What do you think, guys? Will these words matter? No, right? I mean, this word called is can be tweeted by both Trump and Trudeau. Have you, what is so special about this word? This word called the can be tweeted by both Trump and Trudeau. This word called and can be tweeted by both. Whereas a word like USA, huh, USA is a good word. Who is more likely to tweet about USA? Trump is more likely to tweet. So USA is a good word. But these words like is, the and these are not uh, good words. I don't think they will help me to predict uh, whether a tweet has been made by Donald Trump or by Justin Trudeau. So in count vectorizer, if at all a column is being made for this, these words, I want to remove those columns. Okay, so what I will tell my count vectorizer, that count vectorizer, but if you are going to create new columns for these common words, Remove those columns. So I'll say for these common words, do not create a new column. Okay, so I'll say for common words or for stop words, for common words or for stop words in English language, do not create a new column. 
All right, fine. And now have a look. Previously, uh, what had happened was we had 2,528 columns, right? Now you will see lesser number of columns, guys. Now you will see lesser number of columns and have a look. Now you have only around 2,300 columns. Previously, you had more than 2,500 columns. Now you have less columns. So what have you said to count vectorizer that for common words of or stop words in English language, don't create a new column. Okay, fine. Now let me perform the other steps again. And have a look at the accuracy. Just because you removed those bad feature columns, have a look. Previously, your accuracy was 0 0.925. And now have a look. I'll run the code. Now have a look. Now the accuracy has increased to 0 0.9375. Just because you removed those bad feature columns. So this is just to prove to you that yes, if you have bad feature columns involved, it affects your overall calculation. It negatively affects the calculation. So it's better that, okay, if, if suppose you have a column that is not worthy to become a feature, don't have it as a feature column. Okay, so this is just to prove that point. Okay, fine. So we have created our model, our first model of the day. But that, why did we create this model? Just for time pass? No, a model is created for two purposes, either for inferences or for predictions. Let's say I want to do prediction. I want to predict the author of this tweet. Let's say I have a tweet saying that uh, CNN is fake news. Okay. Now, guys, if you follow geopolitics, you would know this. This tweet is more likely to be made by whom? By Donald Trump or by Justin Trudeau? If you follow geopolitics, you would know that. Especially if you have seen Trump's tweets of around 2014, 2015. Right, as Akshit says, Trump is more likely to tweet. Okay. So hopefully your model also uh, feels that Trump is more likely to quit. Let's see if my model correctly predicts that. Okay, we know that okay, Trump is more likely to tweet, make uh, Trump is more likely to make this tweet. Let's see if the model feels that or not. Okay. So before making predictions, there are two points that you need to remember. First important point is to make sure that same changes, the same changes that were applied on the um, what you call the features same needs to be applied on the data that I want to predict on, on the data that I want to predict on. This is point number one. Point number two and the last point that you need to satisfy is that the number of columns in features should match with number of columns in the data that I want to predict. Okay, fine. So let's do it. First point says same changes that were applied on the features, same needs to be applied on the data that I want to predict on. I want to predict on this data. So let's see what changes were applied on the features. So I got my feature or your after that any changes, your no changes, your no changes. What about count vectorizer? In count vectorizer, do we do changes in the feature values? Yes. Non-numeric values are converted to numeric values. So yes, in count vectorizer, there is a change in feature values. So since I applied count vectorizer on my features, I will apply count vectorizer on this data that I want to predict. Okay. So I will say convert the non-numeric values into numeric values. Say so transform the non-numeric values to numeric values. Okay, fine. So let's do that. With this, our point number one will be satisfied. After count vectorizer, I don't believe I have done any change in feature values. Uh, you would say, what about splitting? With splitting, there is no change in feature values. Okay, feature values are kept the same. Is that some values go to training data set, some go to testing data set, but there is no change within the feature values. Okay, fine. So count vectorizer was the only change that I had done on the features. Same change I have applied on the data that I want to predict on. Second point says that number of columns in the features should match with number of columns in the data that I want to predict on. So in my features, how many columns I have? I have, uh, okay, it's referenced by this variable. In my feature, how many columns I have? 
2357 columns and in this data that i want to predict how many columns i have okay so internally what count vectorized has done it has created columns for each of the unique words in the data that it had scanned earlier so there, there were 2300 2, unique words earlier that it had scanned so it created 2300 columns and then based on the count of unique words in this data that i want to predict on values has been assigned to those columns that on the cnn column put a value of one and the is column put a value of one and so on okay fine although i have uh, asked my count vectorizer to not create columns for these common words like is the and so on so probably for this word called is it will and that column would not exist only so it won't assign a value okay if a column does not exist assign a value Okay, anyways, let's take care of the second point. Are the number of columns in features matching with number of columns in the data that I want to predict on? Yes, absolutely. So second point also done. That's it. Now I can make predictions. So I can use my model over here. I can use my model to make predictions. So let me ask the model that who is more likely to make this tweet, Donald Trump or Justin Trudeau? It says Donald Trump exactly like they expect. Let me take a tweet. Uh, directly from Twitter. So let me go to Justin Trudeau's Twitter account. Okay, and let me take his tweet. In fact, let me take his first tweet over here. Okay, this is written in French language, I believe. Uh, luckily in my data, I have passed some tweets that were also written in French language. So that's good. Okay, fine. So now let me pass this tweet and let's see how is the model behaving. Does the model say that this tweet is made by Justin Trudeau? Although guys, this is not a production level model. That means um, uh, this is not a model that I can sell to a company or I can deploy for my company. It's a very basic model. Why? Because it was trained on very less number of rows. Okay. Out of 400 rows, 320 rows were passed into training. So it, it only trained on 320 rows, which is very well less. In real world, you your training data set would have lakhs and lakhs of rows, if not, I mean, or at least thousands of rows, if not in lakhs or crores. Here, the data set is training data set is too small. Okay, so you have only passed very few rows in the training data set. So it's a simple model. So it is bound to do mistakes. Okay, but let's see if uh, this tweet, I mean, gets correctly predicted by the model. Let's see if it says Justin Trudeau, and you can see it does say Justin Trudeau. So, guys, this was our first model of the day. So, in order to implement this model, we had to use some mathematical algorithm. Now, guys, there are two things that you can do. You can arrive at your own mathematical algorithm or you can use some mathematical algorithm directly available in the market. We use the mathematical algorithm directly available in the market. The name of that mathematical algorithm is called multinomial naive base. So, guys, what is the theory of that algorithm? What is the implement? How to implement that algorithm? Is it clear to everyone? Was it clear to each and every one of you? Yes, I will share this notebook, sir. I can see a confirmation in the chat that it's clear. Okay, good to know. So this was our first model of the day. Made using multinomial, multinomial naive base. Okay, let me download this coding file and I will share this coding file to you guys. Okay, I guess in the chat, there is no option for sharing. Okay, so fine. I will ask my team maybe to probably mail or uh, do something else. I don't see an option for sharing over here. Okay, let me check if there is another way. Uh, let me check. Mm, is there a files option? 
Uh, yeah, that could also be done for him. Fine. I'll ask my team to upload it somewhere and give the link of that. Please, please. Okay. The team will decide where to upload it. Fine. All right. A link? Uh, no, no. I mean, this is a local host link, buddy. It's this. Currently, it's the, this coding file is on my local laptop. So you cannot access the files on my local laptop. Okay. Fine. Uh, all right, so my I will upload. I will give the file to my team. The team will decide where to upload it and share with you guys. Okay. Anyways, so this was our first algorithm. Now what we'll do is let's move on to Azure and let's see how to implement such a model. So guys in Azure there were three ways. Anybody remembers those three ways? I'd explain those three ways at the starting of the lecture. So in the beginning five minutes of the lecture itself, we covered those three ways. So I told you guys that Azure allows you to implement machine learning in three approaches. Akhilesh has given the first approach. Akhilesh says first approach is called the automated ML approach, wherein you just pass the task that you want the model to do and Azure will create that type of models for you. Okay, fine. And just by a single click of the button, you will be able to create that model. The second approach, is what the designer approach, right? As um, Akhilesh has mentioned in the chat, designer approach. So in designer, what happens? You have a pre-written blocks of code given to you. Okay. Uh, see, in automated ML, you won't know that behind the scenes what code is implemented. Okay. Behind the scenes what code is implemented, that you won't know in automated ML. In designer ML, pre-written blocks of code are shown to you. Now you need to select which block of code to run at which step. Okay. However, in the third approach, which is called the notebook approach, there you have to write the full code of machine learning by yourself. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, let's create a machine learning workspace. So I'll create a machine learning workspace. How to do it? So guys, try to search for your Azure machine learning service. So currently you can see I'm at the home page of Azure. There's the home page over here, the one that you see on your screen. In my search bar, I will try to search for Azure machine learning service. And then I'll create, try to create a workspace of it. Okay, fine. Now in order to do it, I'll have to fill up this form first. The first field in the form is asking me to select subscription. Remember that in your Azure account, you can have more than one subscriptions created. So let's suppose you are a CEO of a company, you are the head of a company, and you want to ensure that all the employees in your office get access to Azure. So what you are thinking is you will create different, different subscriptions for different, different people. You will create one subscription for a person in the HR team. You will create second subscription, let's say for a person in the IT team and so on. Like this, you can create different, different subscriptions. So in each subscription, you can assign different amount of permissions. So for example, the first subscription you created for a HR employee, the HR employee will not do a lot of work in Azure. Probably the HR employee only needs Azure to store data. So you will make sure that in the first subscription, only access to storage service is given. Okay, whereas in the second, subs the second subscription you are creating for a person in the IT team, this IT person will require a, a lot of work to be done in Azure. So for that person, you will give permission to access all the services of Azure. So like this, in different subscriptions, you can assign different permissions. Also in different subscriptions, you can assign different amount of money. Okay. Let's say the first subscription you created for a HR person, that person is not going to do a lot of work in Azure. So that's why for that subscription, you only uploaded $5 worth of credit. Whereas the second subscription that you created is for a person in the IT team that IT person will do a lot of work in Azure. So for that person, uh, let's say you are thinking to upload more amount of money in that subscription, let's say $1,000. So like this, in our Azure account, you can create multiple subscriptions. Each subscription can have different amount of permissions set to it, and each subscription can have different amount of money uploaded into it. So you can choose the subscription of your choice. Okay, here there are two subscriptions. Uh, both of them have been given to me by Microsoft only since I'm a Microsoft certified trainer. Both of them have been given to me by Microsoft. 
this subscription has been uh, this MLDN subscription has been given to me for permanent usage. OK, um, so till I exist as a MCT, this subscription will be given to me. Uh, it's just that uh, the money in that subscription, uh, so every month they upload around $100 worth of credit. Microsoft uploads it. So in one of my lectures, what had happened was I had extinguished the credits and I wanted to do work on Azure. So I asked Microsoft to create a temporary subscription till uh, this MSDN subscription gets refilled with more money. Till that time, I asked Microsoft to create a temporary subscription. So this Azure Pass subscription was a temporary subscription that Microsoft gave to me. Okay, fine. But uh, the disadvantage is that it is only available. I mean, even here you have hundred dollars worth of credit, uh, but it's only given to me for one month. Okay, whereas this MSDN subscription is given to me for permanent time. So as long as I stay MCT, this MSDN subscription will stay with me. OK, so let me select MSDN subscription because in Azure Pass subscription, I mean, it's only valid till one month. Probably that duration will get over soon within a few days. And uh, if uh, after a few days, the subscription will, uh, will uh, get deleted. So if the subscription gets deleted, then the work that I do in that subscription will also get deleted. Okay, so that's why let me choose MSDN. After that, I'm being asked to put my resource in a resource group. Remember, I'm trying to create a resource of Azure machine learning service. Whenever I want to use any service of Azure, what happens is we have to create a resource of that service. So here, what I'm doing currently, I'm creating a resource of Azure machine learning service. So it is asking me to put that resource in some of the other resource group. What are the benefits of putting a resource in a resource group? By the way, it's mandatory to put a resource in a resource group. But what are the benefits? Let's see. So let's say you are working on a project. And for that project, you had to create 20 resources. One resource was that of Azure Machine Learning Service. Another resource was that of Storage Service and so on. Now, let's say that project got over after six months. And now these resources that you had created are of no use to you. So what you will do, maybe one approach could be that, okay, you go to each resource one by one and delete them manually, right? But that will be very tedious going into each of the 20 resources individually, then clicking on the delete button to delete those resources will be very tedious. Instead of that, why don't we have resources that belong to the same project inside the same exact resource group? Why don't we have resources that belong to same project inside the same exact resource group. And when the time for deletion will come, at that time, I, I can directly delete the resource group. With that, all the resources in that resource group will get deleted automatically. So it's like if I delete a folder, all the files in that folder get deleted automatically, right? Similarly, if I delete a resource group, all the resources in that resource group get automatically deleted. So one benefit of resource group is a life cycle management. Okay, that resources that have the same life cycle, you know that okay on 23rd of September, all of these resources collectively will be of no use for you. So you will put those resources in the same resource group so that you can delete them in one go. So one benefit is life cycle management. What is the second benefit? Okay, second benefit is cost management. So let's suppose you are working on a project for which you had to create 20 resources. Now you want to calculate the total cost incurred by your project. So one approach would be what? To go into each resource one by one individually and see the individual cost. So you will say that, okay, first resource uh, um, had costed you $5. Second resource had costed you $2.16 and so on. Then you can go ahead and at the end take the sum of all these individual costs. And that is how you will arrive at total cost incurred by your project. But that will be very tedious, finding the individual cost of every resource and then taking the sum. Okay, instead of that, why don't we have projects? Sorry, why don't we have resources that belong to the same project inside the same exact resource group? And when the time for cost calculation will come, just by a single click of the button, I can directly get the cumulative cost of all the resources in that resource group just by a single click of the button. Okay, so, res so resource group helps for better cost management as well. 
So one benefit was life cycle management. Second benefit was cost management. There are many, many more benefits. In short, just remember that resource group helps for better management of resources. Okay. So either you can select an existing resource group or create a new one. I'll create a new one over here called webinar RG. Then it's asking me to give a name to that resource. So let me give a name. I'll call it webinar ML resource. Okay, fine. Then I'm being asked to choose the reason. Uh, just make sure that you choose a region closer to your user. Let's say, sub, let's suppose this resource you are creating for a person in United States, then choose a region closer to United States just for better latency. Okay, so if the person is in United States, the resource is also is in United States, that person will be able to access the resource faster. Okay, fine. So just make sure that uh, you choose the region that is closer to your user just for better latency. Okay, fine. After that, let's go ahead and let's let's learn about other fields that are shown to you over here. So we have this field called storage account. Okay, so what it does, guys, is automatically it creates a resource of storage account service. So there is a storage account service in Azure. You can think of storage account service as something similar to Google Drive. Just like in Google Drive, you can uh, uh, upload any type of files. In storage account service also, you can upload any type of files. Okay, for those of you who are completely new to Azure, you can think of storage account as something that is similar to Google Drive. Just like in Google Drive, you can upload any type of files. In storage account, you can upload any type of files. Okay, so uh, any files that will be used for uh, building our machine learning model uh, will be stored in this storage account resource. Okay, internally it will be stored in a storage account resource. Okay, then you have another field over here called Key Vault. So what is Key Vault? It's another service and here it's a resource of it has been created. So Key Vault is the place where you can manage and store secrets such as API keys and passwords that your application might need to access services. So it's to protect your keys or any other secrets you have. Okay. After that, you have something called application insights, which is another service and a resource of this service has been created, is being created for you. You can see it says new resource of that service has been created. It automatically creates it. Uh, and this service called application insights helps you to monitor the performance and usage of your live applications. So whenever we want to monitor the performance of our uh, machine learning model, this application insights service will be especially useful for that. Then you have something called container registry. So guys, this is where you can store and manage your private Docker container images. Okay, you can store and manage your private Docker container images. Now, although for our current webinar, we won't need any Docker container images, still let me explain uh, what is a Docker container image, okay? So Docker container images are often used for deploying applications. Now you might wonder what Docker images are. So let's understand it with a simple example. Imagine that you have a model ship. Okay. Imagine that you have a model ship. Let's say you have a ship. Okay. That toys we have, that toy, that model of a ship. If you remember a small size model of a ship. Let's suppose you have that model. Okay. And you want to send that model to a friend in another city so that they can see exactly what it looks like. Now, what you can try to do, you can try to send all the individual pieces and instructions, but there is a risk that something could get lost or your friend might not put, might not be able to put that model together again. Okay, let's say you are trying to break this model into small, small parts. Okay, and those parts you are trying to ship. Okay, now there is a danger. What is the danger that, okay, you are trying to send the parts of that ship to your friend, but maybe that friend might not know how to put those parts together, or maybe some of the parts could get lost during transport. So instead, what you decide is, you uh, instead you try to decide the entire ship altogether, where it's fully assembled and fully visible. In computer terms, Docker container images are like that clear container holding your model ship. 
Okay. So you can think of it as a container holding your model ship. In computer terms, coming back to our terminology, I said that Docker images are used a lot in deploying applications. Okay. So sometimes what might happen is that let's say you're working in a de development team. Okay. So you have a development team, testing team on your office, right? So whenever a development team creates something, testing team's job is to test it. So let's say a uh, uh, development team has created a uh, application uh, using Python language 3.11. So now testing team should also test it with the same version. No? So like, that means what I'm saying is environment should be same. If development was done on the same environment, testing should be done in the same environment. So one approach is what that, okay, people can create a document, development team can create a document that, okay, install these, these uh, libraries, install these, these things, then only you will be able to test our code. But uh, if you send that entire long documentation, it could get a little difficult for the testing team to implement everything that is there in the documentation, to install all the things that you have mentioned in your documentation. Instead, what you think is, why don't we pass a container Okay, wherein there is everything present. Okay, our coding file is present. The libraries are present. Everything is present. And that container, you will pass it to the other team. Let's say testing team. So now the testing team won't have to import the libraries by its own. You're passing that entire container of your coding, of your libraries, everything you are passing in that container. So the testing team will just take that container and using the container, it will play, then place it in their laptop. And then in their laptop, they will have access to everything, your coding file, libraries, everything. Okay. So this uh, is better. Okay. This approach is much better um, in order uh, to uh, share the environment of your application. Okay, because development team could have created the application in a different environment. Your testing team might test it in a different environment. That should not happen. I want that testing team also test in the same environment in which the development team created it. So if development team created it with Python version 3.11, the testing team should also do that. And similarly, with all the other libraries, let's say development team uh, 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 created a model uh, using uh, sklearn version of uh, 2, then Testing team should also test the model using sklearn version of two. Okay, so that the code works uh, as expected. Okay, fine. So uh, what you are thinking is, uh, you know, to not have any ambiguity between the development team environment and testing team environment, the development team thought to pass the entire container, which contains everything that is needed for the testing team to run the code. So for that, you can. Uh, use Docker images, although in our scenario, we won't use Docker images. So let's not talk about it. Then I will directly click on review plus create. With that, what Azure will do? Azure will try to create a resource of machine learning, of Azure machine learning service. Okay. Azure will try to create a resource of Azure machine learning service. So let's wait for the resource to get fully created. It will take around three to four minutes to, to, for that resource to get created. And then I will show you what next to After that, I will show you what next to do. So let's wait for around three to four minutes for the resource to get fully created. Oh yeah, currently you can see that creation is in progress. I'm just waiting for the resource to get created successfully. Once the resource is created successfully, we'll see what to do next where. Uh, so what I will be doing next is that same model that I had implemented earlier. I mean, I implemented it manually from scratch, but now I want to implement that model with help of Azure. Okay. So for that, I created a resource of Azure machine learning service. And now using the resource, let's implement a model. There are three approaches as I had explained to you. First is automated ML approach. Second is designer ML approach. Third is notebook approach. Okay. Uh, we'll start with auto automated ML approach. So let's go to the resource. And let me launch the machine learning studio so that I can do the work in that studio.
and once my studio is fully launched, I will explain the menu options that you would see in that studio. Okay, so you can see there's a left hand side menu. Uh, one is uh, the first menu option is home page, right? Here, if I click on home page, uh, you can see there are various shortcuts to create models. Also, below you will see certain documentation as well. Okay, so that is the home page. Then, second option over here is called model catalog. So, guys, under model catalog, this is where your machine learning models are stored. So, it's like a catalog in a library. It lets you browse through all the models that you have. Okay. So uh, here, what has uh, what OpenAI company has done is OpenAI company, by the way, is the one that has created Chat GPT product. Okay. So OpenAI company has tied up with Azure company. So whatever models OpenAI creates, it makes it available on Azure as well. So you can see those models that OpenAI has created. If you want to use them, you can use them here. Okay, you can see many of those models. Some have been created by OpenAI, some have been created directly by Azure, and so on. Okay, so this model catalog. Then you have this section of notebooks. As I mentioned, there are three approaches to implement machine learning. One approach is automated ML, second approach is designer ML, third approach is notebook. So here you can create a notebook file. Okay, and guys, the same code that I wrote earlier. In my Jupyter notebook file, same exact code I can write in my Azure notebook file. Same exact code. It will work. Okay. Then the next option is automated ML. So, as I mentioned, there are three approaches to implement machine learning. One is automated ML. Okay. Wherein um, you just mention uh, the type of model that you want to create, and Azure will create that model for you. You don't have to write any code whatsoever. The second approach that I had mentioned was designer ML. As I mentioned here, you will have certain pre-written uh, blocks of code present, and you will have to select which block of code to execute at which step. Okay, so let me uh, just show that to you. Let's suppose I try to create a pipeline and design our image. Let me wait for that pipeline to fully open. It's trying to open. Let me refresh this page. So as I mentioned in designer ML, you have pre-written blocks of code present, and uh, you need to uh, uh, decide which block of code to execute in which scenario. Okay, yeah, I can. Oh, sorry, that menu was hidden on the left hand side. Okay, so over here you can see uh, for uh, create uh, for different different scenarios, different different blocks are present. So let's say for scoring, for evaluating the model, there is a block of code. Before scoring, what do you do? You train the model. So there will be a block of code for training, for training the model. And like this, you will connect the two things. Okay, and like this, you will implement. Okay, I'm not diving into much. I'm just giving you an overview over here that currently there are pre-written blocks of code. All you have to do is mention which block of code to execute at which step. Okay, before training, obviously, there are other steps that you need to do. So there are pre-written blocks of code present over here. Okay. Then you have something called prompt flow. Okay. The next menu is prompt flow. Okay. So this is a visual tool that lets you drag and drop elements to create machine learning models without writing. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, so we can say, I mean, um, okay, I think uh, this prompt flow, if I uh, remember correctly, it was introduced uh, just a few months back, and it's a feature to create sequences of actions or uh, questions guiding you through a process or workflow. Okay, what is it? It is a feature to create sequences of actions guiding you through a process or workflow. So first you can mention that, okay, you want to do this task, then that task, and so on. Okay, so that entire flow of actions you can pass it over. Although for uh, this webinar, uh, I won't show that lab to you. Okay. Then um, after that, let's go ahead and let's talk about more. This tracing is in preview stage, so we won't talk about it. Anything is that in preview stage, uh, it's not uh, recommended to use it for development purposes. We'll not talk about that. Coming to coming under assets over here, there are multiple options. One is data. So this is where you manage your data sets. So it's like a folder where you can keep all your documents. Okay. Then you have something called jobs. 
So this is where you can manage and uh, track the execution of various tasks or processes that you have run. Okay, so whether it is a training job or a scoring job, whatever task you are running, uh, you can go ahead and track the execution of that task over there. Then you have something called components. Okay, uh, so your uh, let's say for designer, uh, you have already pre-written blocks of code, but let's say a block of code you want to design. Okay, a block of code or a component you want to create. You can go ahead and create that block of code over here so that you can use it in designer everything. Okay, then here there is a shortcut available to create pipelines in designer ML. Okay, then we have something called environments. So these are nothing but the setups for your code to run, including the hardware and software settings. Okay, so while training the model, it will ask which environment to use. And so here, um, you have the necessary hardware and software setup present. Okay. Then you have something called models. So this is where your trained models, the models that you have trained will come in. What about this uh, uh, above option model catalog? Here, these were pre-trained models. Here you will get access to pre-trained models, whereas below you will get access to your models that you have trained. Okay, then you have something called endpoints. Okay, so what are endpoints? So these are nothing but URLs uh, that you can use to access your machine learning model. So let's say you want to share your machine learning model with someone. You can just give the URL of that machine learning model so that let's say a friend who is sitting in uh, America can test it out. You created a model in India, but you want to share this model with someone in the US. You will just give a URL of that model. Uh, that yeah. URL is nothing but called an endpoint. Then let's talk about the various options present on the manage section. So first option is compute. So this is where you manage the processing power for running your machine learning models. It's like choosing the engine for your car. Okay. So there are different, different uh, computes present. If you observe. Okay. Let's explore each compute option one by one. Okay. There are different computes. So guys, uh, compute instances in Azure machine learning are like your personal workstations set up in the cloud. Okay. Just like you have a computer at your desk where you do the work, a compute instance. Okay. You are a compute instance is nothing but a virtual computer that Azure provides you to do your task over the internet. Okay. So uh, it's like having a single computer online. Fine. Then on the other hand, you have something called compute clusters. So what are compute clusters? So guys, imagine that you have a big project like making a giant puzzle and you have several friends to help you. So instead of everyone working on the puzzle in a small space and getting in each uh, and getting in uh, each other's way, you decide to spread out in a large hall where every person works on a piece of puzzle. Uh, and as more friends join, the puzzle gets done faster, right? Another example could be, let's say you are trying to do a task in your office. If you do the task in your home, uh, let's say it's like, let's say if you did the task in your office individually, it might take you more time. If you divide the task among your team members, the same task will be done faster. The same applies over here. So here you can take help of multiple computers that will work in parallel to do that uh, computation job. Okay. So if you want to, let's say, train a model. Um, then you can uh, take help of multiple computers over here with, with, with help of which this training job or any other job that you want to do uh, can be done faster. Okay, so that is about compute clusters. Now let's go ahead and let's talk about Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes clusters. So we are also, uh, it's like having a group of computers. Okay, uh, but let's try to understand the difference between a compute cluster and Kubernetes cluster. So guys, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so guys, imagine that you have a bunch of robots at your disposal and you want them to work on building different parts of a car. So you could manage each robot individually, telling uh, one to work on the cell, telling one robot to work on wheels, telling another robot to work on engine and so on. But that could be a lot of work for you especially if you have a lot of robots and the tasks change often. So Kubernetes is like a robot manager. So you tell the manager what needs to be done and it figures out which robots should do which task. 
okay how they should work together and what to do if something goes wrong with one of the robots okay so here what will happen is uh, the uh, division of the work among multiple computers will be done more uh, better okay it will be done more efficiently so in kubernetes cluster uh, the division of work among the computers yes you are creating you are using multiple computers over here but the distribution of that task among those multiple computers will be done more efficiently as compared to compute cluster but the disadvantage is that kubernetes clusters are costly as well okay advantage is that it is more efficient uh, the disadvantage is that it is more costly okay then you have another option over here uh, called uh, attach compute okay you have another option over here called attach compute so guys uh, in atta let's say you had created a, a computer or a group of computers outside of azure ml and you want to bring them in azure ml then you can go and attach those other computes that you have created okay so let's say uh, there is a service called azure databricks if you guys have worked on azure databricks you would know that there also you can create a single computer you, you, or you can create multiple computers you can ask azure to create a single computer for you or ask azure to create multiple computers for you so in short you are asking azure to create a compute okay now that compute you, that you created in databricks you want to implement and uh, you want to include in azure ml then you can go ahead and do that over here okay after that you have something called serverless instances so what is an example of that Okay, what do we mean by serverless instances over here? So, uh, guys, in serverless instances, uh, what happens is um, you are only charged for the work that you do. Okay, so it's like having a compute instance, having a single computer, but here, this single computer will be available to you for full time. So, even if you are not doing any work, still you will have to pay the cost. Okay, so it's like, for example, uh, let's say I have bought a car on EMI. Let's say for the entire month, I didn't use the car. Fine, my petrol cost will get saved, but my EMI, I will still have to pay to the bank. I cannot say to the bank that I didn't use the car, so why should I pay the EMI, right? So in compute instance, yeah, uh, you, you're getting a single computer at your disposal. So fine, if you don't use it, yes, additional computation cost gets, uh, I mean, it, it, Azure doesn't ask you for that. But the fact that Azure is giving you a single computer for you to use for permanent time, uh, you will have to pay some cost. Okay, you will have to pay some cost. Fine. Uh, or you can think of it like uh, buying a house on rent. Okay, buying a house on rent. So even if you um, don't do any work in that house, still you'll have to pay that rent. Na? Okay. On the other hand, serverless instances like let's say um, paying for only the job that you do. Okay. So only when you do want to do the work at that time, uh, the computer will be given to you and you only pay for the job that you want to do. Okay. So it's like hiring a cab. So only when I have the cab, let's say only for the travel that I do in the cab, only for that, I have to pay the cost. Right. Um, but otherwise I don't have to pay any cost whatsoever. So that's the benefit of serverless. Uh, instance as compared to compute instance in compute instance even though you are not doing any work still have, you will have to pay the rent whereas in serverless instance uh, you will only pay for what work you are doing okay uh, so at the time of doing the work azure will uh, search for any compute that, uh, azure will search for any computer that is free and at that time it will provide the computer but what is the disadvantage that may be due to traffic let's say if it at that time it is not able to provide a computer uh, immediately then you might lose out on time okay there are other disadvantages as well okay but fine i have just given you an overview of each of these computes compute instances like buying a single computer here you are having many computers here also you can ask for many computers, but this is more efficient. Here you can attach a compute that you created in a separate service. Okay, here also you create a single computer, but it's uh, but you pay for the work that you do. Okay, then you have a field of 
uh, you have an option over here called monitoring. So what does it mean? So uh, here um, you can keep an eye on your model's performance and your model's health. Okay, so what was the accuracy of the model and all of that. Then data labeling. So this tool helps you to label your data. Okay. Um, I mean, you will see a lab on this in a course of AI 102. Okay. Uh, so there, uh, this is a certification course. So there, there's a lab to work with images. So there's a lab to train the model based on images, but then it wanted to assign a target value to each of those images. So it wanted to assign a label. Remember that target values are also known as labels. So if you want to assign labels to these images one by one, okay, and after assigning a label, you might want all of that information in a separate file called a COCO file. You will see that in that certification. What is a COCO file? It tells that, okay, um, where is the image? Then what is the target value present for that image and so on? What is the size of the image? All of the details it mentions. Okay, fine. Anyways, so this will be useful in that lab, AI 102 related lab. For our current webinar, it will not be useful. Then you have link services. So this will be to connect to other services that you might want to use. Let's say after creating a model in machine learning service, you want to do analysis in Synapse service. So you will connect machine learning with Synapse. Fine. All right, so you can, uh, for creating a link service, you'll first have to create a connection. And once that connection is created, then you can go ahead and create a link service based on it. Here you can see automatically connections have been created. Particularly if you remember while creating the Azure machine learning resource, it had asked uh, that, okay, uh, what name do you want to give to your storage account resource? I uh, told you that it automatically creates a resource of storage account service and any data uh, that you upload for your machine learning models will be stored in your storage account resource. Okay, so you can, it has created these connections to storage account resource automatically. If you want to create more connections, you can. Okay, anyways, I just wanted to give you an overview of each of these options. Coming back to our main uh, web webinar. Okay, don't worry, uh, just in a few minutes, I'll give you break for lunch. Um, okay, now let me go ahead and let me train the model over here. Okay, so in order to train the model, uh, what I'm doing is I'll first try to upload the data set. So I'll go to data section and I'll try to upload the data set over here. So I'll give a name to the data set. I will call it diabetes data set, let's say. Okay, the type, I can choose the appropriate type over here. There are different types. One is tabular. Tabular means what? It means that your data is table format like a Excel spreadsheet with rows and columns. Then you have something called file. Okay, so uh, your uh, let's say if your data you don't want in a tabular format. Okay, uh, then uh, uh, if it's uh, of any, if you're just getting the data, let's say in a something like a text file, then you can go ahead and choose this option over here. Okay, fine. Uh, after that, you have different, different options. Okay. You're in my scenario. My data is in tabular format only. So that's fine. I will explain different formats, different types to you. Don't worry for now. Let's stick with tabular type because before uh, moving on to the break, I want to start uh, the training job. The training will take one hour. So till our lunch break is going on, the training will get completed in the background. Okay. So I'll explain these types in detail. Don't worry for now. Let me progress ahead. Okay, now from where do I want to get the data? Um, so I will say my data I want to get from local files. Okay, let's get it from local files. So locally from my laptop. Uh, uh, let me upload it to my uh, any other place over here. Okay, what place could I select? Or fine, let me do one thing. Uh, uh, what I will do is by default, my machine learning resource connects to storage account resource, right? Okay, so fine. So st from storage account resource, I will try to get the files. Okay, fine. So to through storage account resource, I'll try to get the files. All right. Uh, now what I will do is 
I will try to upload my file first in my storage account resource. So let me go ahead and let me upload the files over here. And in order to upload the files, first I need to have that file present. Uh, so to have that file present, what I'm thinking is, um, let me just check if I have that file present or else I'll try to download it. Or else what we'll do is we'll try to download it. Let me check. Okay, I'm just trying to see if there is a appropriate file over here. Mm. Okay, I don't see it properly as such. No worries. No worries. Uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll try to see. Okay, it should be called something like diabetes. Yeah, I have it. Okay, I have it. Perfect. Let me open it up. And let me see how it looks like. And let us have a look. Okay, so this is the data. Fine. Uh, so now let me do one thing. Uh, this is the data that I want to upload, right? Okay. So in fact, why don't why am I creating a data asset over here? Let me cancel this. This is, this will be a long approach. I'll show you that long approach as well. But before moving on to the break, let me show you a shorter approach. Okay, so I want to implement machine learning by using doing automated ML. So let me go to automated ML. I'll say create an automated ML job. What is the type of model that you want to create? Okay, so first give this job name. So I'll say this is to create a sample model. Okay, now in that. Um, I mean, while creating the model, you can do more and more experiments. That first, you can create a model with uh, one feature column. So you can create a model with two feature columns and so on. Like that, you can do experiments that, okay, with different, different, in different, different scenarios, how is the model behaving? Okay, so currently you are doing your first experiment. So I'll call it first EXP. Okay, then you can give a description that you like. You can assign tags, just like in a clothing shop. You have tags assigned to the clothes. It helps to find the clothes faster, right? So that you can understand. Uh, it helps for getting additional information for that clothes. Just like that, here you can go ahead and assign tags that you can mention that, okay, this was created for what? So I'll say this was created for my webinar. Then what was the purpose? I'll say purpose was just uh, to show the tutorial. Like that, you can assign tags. It's up to you whether you want to do it or not. OK, I, I will not assign any tags over here, so I'll cancel out these tags. Let me click on next button. Then the task type, what do I want to do? Let's suppose I want to do classification. OK, so I have selected classification. Then I want to select uh, the data on which I want to uh, train the model. OK, so let's do that. Okay, let's give a name over here to our data. I'll call it diabetes data. And uh, let me first upload my data in a storage account resource. So I'll go to my resource group, upload my data in a storage account resource over here, and I'll give you a break in 1.30. Don't worry, guys. I'll just take 10 minutes more. From 1.30 to 2.30, we'll have a break. Let me go to my storage account resource and let me upload my data over there. I'll go to containers. Container is nothing but a folder. Okay, so let me upload my data over there. Okay, uh, I'm just thinking over here in my scenario. Hmm, where should I upload my data for better organization? Let me upload it over here. In this blob store folder, I will upload it. OK, I've uploaded the file. Uh, now what we'll do is we'll just go ahead. We'll try to um, select this file. OK, 
let's go ahead and let's try to select it. Okay, so in the blob store folder, okay, uh, I want my file to be present. Okay, I had already uploaded it, but fine. Uh, no worries. Even here, there is an upload button. So fine. In fact, I can remove that upload. No worries. Okay, fine. So remove, let me remove that upload. I mean, if I directly upload it, not an issue, but here there is an upload button present. So why don't we do that? Okay, so here I'm saying now upload the file. Which file? I will say diabetes.csv. Let's upload it. Okay, so I'm passing my data that, okay, this is my data on which I want to create a model. Okay. And after that, it is asking for the settings related to data. Currently, it's a CSV file, right? CSV stands for comma separated values. So that means comma separated values means your values are written in text format, but separated by a delimiter like comma. Okay, fine. So yes, this comes under delimited text category. CSV file is one of the files that comes under delimited text. Okay, so fine. Uh, the values are in text format separated by one delimiter. Which delimiter? Comma. Then each of the characters in the file will be uh, read using which encoding algorithm. So I'll say UTF-8, which is especially good for uh, identifying your SKI characters. SKI characters are the characters that you see on your keyboard over here. Okay, so all of those characters that you see on your keyboard, whether alphabetical characters, numeric characters, all of them are your SKI characters. Then do all the columns have headers? That means do they have column names? If I open this file up, do does the does it have column names yes all the columns have column names over here at the starting so i'll say yes all the columns have headers do you want to skip reading any rows no i don't want to skip any reading any rows fine uh, let me click on next then if you want to include any column or remove any column you can do that changes data type all of that you can do okay fine uh, this path column guys is automatically added by azure Okay, it's not, it was not there in a data set. So what it does is in every row, it contains the path of the file. So let's say there are 100 rows in the data set. In all the 100 rows, it will mention the same path. Okay. Uh, so that's why you can see it is automatically deselected that do not make a model on this path column. Uh, this path column was introduced by uh, Azure ML resource just for reference purposes. And you can see it is automatically deselected that, that do not in include that's this column for model building purposes, model training purposes. Okay, let me click on next. With this, my data has been uh, uploaded. Okay, now I will say the task type. Which task type? I will say classification. Using which data? Diabetes data. Okay. So I want to build a classification model. What is my target column? Here, guys, my target column is, let's say I want to predict whether a person is diabetic or not. So there is a last column which mentions if a person is diabetic or not. Zero means the person is not diabetic. One means the person is diabetic. So I want to predict whether a patient is diabetic or not. So diabetic column will be my target column. Okay. Uh, do you want to enable deep learning? No, I want to use machine learning only. That's fine. Uh, then how do you want to divide into training and uh, testing? Okay. So I will say I want to do one second. Uh, I want to do uh, split over here. And what I will do is uh, here, let me explain these options. Currently, you see these options over here of clause validation. What is that option? Let me explain that to you. And don't worry, guys, in, in 1.30, I'll give you a break. Okay, let's uh, understand about cross validation. Okay. So uh, in train test split, there is one issue could be ar that is there is one issue that could be arise. Solution to that issue is cross validation. Let's understand that issue. OK, now um, let me ask a simple question to each and every one of you, not related to machine learning, a general question I'm asking. OK, let's suppose, guys, you are a CEO of a company. And you want to hire a candidate. OK, you want to hire a software engineer. Now, one person has come to you saying that uh, I have taken this uh, coding test and I have got 100 out of 100 marks in that coding test. Just based on that one test, 
will you hire that person yes or no what do you feel just based on that one test will you hire that person no you are absolutely correct you will not hire but what was what is the reason why will you not hire you are you guys are absolutely right you will not hire based on the one test why what is the reason you have given correct answer but what is the reason so guys can i see this is i mean maybe that test that the guy attempted uh, was a simple test that's why the student uh, they, that's why the candidate performed well okay maybe if i give it a harder test the candidate might not perform well so what you want is just by this one test you are not trying to judge the candidate so what is the solution so in order to uh, hire this candidate what will you do as a ceo you will conduct more test can i say that can i say that akshit yes i will conduct more test so that's the solution right conduct more test you as a ceo are thinking no fine uh, you have uh, taken one test okay good for you but i don't believe uh, that one test is enough to judge your performance i want to conduct more test guys can the same logic be applied to machine learning model or not that you are testing the model on one testing data set so just by one test how can you judge the model then if by one test you cannot judge a software engineer if you feel that you cannot judge a software engineer by one test then how can you judge a model by one test so the solution is to do more tests on the model okay solution is to do more tests how will we do it okay guys do you remember your school time wherein uh, uh, you used to conduct semester exam at least i remember guys when i was up till uh, when i was in second standard na at that time we only used to have semester exams only semester exams okay and uh, then government introduced the rule that just by semester exam it's not good to judge a student so they introduced something called unit tests okay in maharashtra it's called unit test in different states it's called different in some states it's called sessional exams right in different states it's called different in maharashtra i stay in maharashtra in mumbai here it's called unit test okay so the idea of unit test was to have these small small tests conducted before a semester exam right okay the same will apply on the model okay the same rule that government uh, introduced to test us same rule we will introduce to test the model okay let's see how we do it okay so the idea is something like this that okay you have your data set some part of it is of testing some part of it is training you will reserve the testing data set for your semester exam so the test that you do on your testing data set it's like a semester exam but before conducting that semester exam you will do small small tests okay now let me put a question to uh, you guys question in unit test and question in semester exam should it be separate or no if you are the principal you want to judge the student performance of the student whether the student knows the concept or not then what will you what will you as a principal do have separate exams in uh, uh, unit test separate sorry have separate questions in unit test separate questions in semester exam right as akshit mentions okay similarly guys the rows to test the semester exam and the rows to test the uh, the rows uh, for testing the semester exam and the rows for uh, doing a test of unit test will be separate so in order to conduct unit test i will not use my testing data set in order to conduct unit test i will use my training data set rows because testing data set rows i am using for my semester exam i, I want to keep it separate okay so on training data set i will do the small small tests which i will call it unit tests so how to conduct that unit test that approach of conducting unit test is called cross validation okay so let's see how to do it so what we do is we take our training data set guys we take our training data set and that training data set will be divided into multiple parts okay let's suppose i'm dividing it into three parts 1 2 and 3 in the first iteration in the first round or first iteration what will happen is part number 1 could be selected for testing 
the remaining parts could be selected for training. Then in the second round or second iteration, what will happen is, again, same three parts. But now part number two will be selected for testing the remaining parts for training. Then in the third iteration or third round, what I will have to do is again divided into same three parts. But in the third round or third iteration, Part number three, I will have in testing. The remaining parts I will have in test uh, training. Okay, fine. Now have a look. Now have a look. Uh, am I using each part for testing at least once over here? Akhilesh, am I doing that? Am I using each part for testing at least once? Okay. So now I won't do any further iterations. I will stop my further iterations. So guys, if you divide your training data into three parts, you will do three iterations. If you divide your training data into four parts, you'll be able to do four iterations. Okay, fine. So now guys, what we are doing is we are conducting these small, small tests. So this, this uh, year I'm doing a small test. Okay, it's a test on only small part of the data. So it's a small test. I'll call it unit test. I'll call it unit test one. Similarly here, I will test it. So I will call it unit test two. Similarly here, I will test it. So I'll call it unit test three. Okay, so here I'm conducting unit test. This is called K fold cross validation, where K indicates the number of iterations that you want to do. So here I did three iterations. So this will be called three fold cross validation. If I do five iterations, it will be called five fold cross validation. If I do nine iterations, it will be nine fold cross validation. So the idea is that you do small, small unit test. And only if the score in unit test is good, then only you do the semester exam. See, semester exam is done on the testing data set. Okay, that data set was kept separate. For unit tests, we take our training data set. Okay, and then we do small, small unit tests. Only if the score in unit test is good, then only we go to semester exam. Okay, so that's the idea of K-fold cross-validation. So we'll implement that over here. So I'll say K-fold cross-validation. How many iterations do I have? I will say three. Okay, fine. And uh, let me introduce three additional data set you want to use uh, for testing. No, this is fine over here. All right, then the compute that you want to use. So let me use compute cluster. That means let me have a team of computers working. Uh, I'll select the type over here. I'll say dedicated uh, GPU will cost me more. So let me use CPU and for CPU, you can see different different options. Okay, uh, you can mention the strength of every computer in your pool. Okay, so over here, let me select this. Then how many computers you want? Minimum number of computers, maximum number of computers. I'll say minimum one, maximum three. Maximum three. Okay, currently what is happening? I guess I don't have... Um, uh, the right uh, uh, permission to set a higher number of nodes. Mm, currently, I guess I will have to request for that quota extension. No worries. Um, currently, it seems that each um, computer will use uh, six cores. And I guess I only have six cores available. Maybe in my other computes that I've created for other services, uh, uh, my cores have been utilized in that. Fine, not a worry. So let me keep it to minimum number only. Fine. Let me assign a name to my compute. I will say test compute or team of computers. Fine. So that's it. Let me select. Um, let me mention the settings of that team of com uh, computers. I have mentioned it. Minimum zero computers, maximum one. So I mean, it's not a team. Essentially, it's one computer only because it was not allowing me to increase the number of computers because of that uh, quota issue that I had in my subscription. Fine, I will have to take care of that quota issue. Not a worry. Fine, I've selected this uh, compute. Now let me move forward and let me start the training job. Now what will happen, guys, now that I've clicked on this tra submit training button, internally it will do the training for us. So you can see we didn't have to write any code. 
all all we have done is mention the settings that okay what type of model do i want to create on all of that that's it and you can see the status currently it says not started fine it will start the training and i guess in a half an hour or one hour it will complete the training okay so till then what we'll do is we'll take a lunch break and after that we'll be back so we have done two things before moving on to the lunch break we have done two things first i showed you how to implement a machine learning model from scratch and then i showed you how to implement a machine learning model with azure so guys are both the approaches making sense to you obviously you will need to do more practice but are they making sense to you just put a confirmation in the chat uh, understanding guys yes okay fine so uh, fine so let's take a lunch break guys of one hour after that we'll be back till then our model will keep on training itself Fine. And then after the lunch break, we'll come back. Uh, up till now, I've only shown you how to build a, a classification model. I will show you how to build a regression model as well. Okay, and we'll do all of that. Fine. So let me take a break of one hour. And after that, we'll be back, Grace. <laughs> 